So welcoming everybody back for day two session. Oh, I've got these the wrong way around. No, I haven't. Yes, I have for myself, just so that I know where I am. That's all. Um, welcome to day two, days, day, this is going well, isn't it? Day two session of the introduction to R&R &R Studio. So yesterday we finished off with an import of a CSV and the CSV file was um, quite unusual in that it didn't need any cleaning at all. There was no uh, blank spaces or wrong dates or anything, which is uh, very, very rare when you get data, particularly when you're getting it from the internet, I found. So we're going to have a go at importing a messy data set using the same techniques that we used yesterday to reinforce that um, process using a wizard in our studio. But then um, we're also going to do a bit of data cleaning using that wizard. So just to launch into this, we're going to import data that we're then subsequently going to use for some other tidying and using some functions from the dplyr package, which is part of Tidyverse. It's data specifically that explores the mental health inpatient capacity, um, which is from a data set that's submitted to uh, NHS England. And I think it's called KHO3, slightly cleaned already that we've got, but we're going to do a little bit more with it. And it's from 2017 to 2018. So it is quite out of date. There we go, KHO3. And it's been scraped from the NHSE statistics website. But I, I couldn't find the original. But what I was quite grateful for is that in one of the courses for R, somebody, the person who did these statistics in 2017, 2018, um, said that's my data, which is really nice. It's a small world in the NHS. Now it's a really good chance for me to talk about accessible spreadsheets as well with the government data standards, which I think are just excellent for general things. It started off for me anyway, my knowledge about this was about spreadsheets, but then they've also done things about colors and charts, releasing statistics, which I think is really important. Uh, all the information about accessibility as they work through it goes on this website. Now, the issue that we have with these spreadsheets is for analysts like us here and across the NHS and public sectors and also the government is that you'll have to clean your data. The formatting is incorrect. You, know, you sometimes have blank spaces, blank rows. And when you're trying to then do some data manipulation with it, either visualizing it or in, I should say, something, a coded language like R or Python, you have to remove all these spaces. Um, and that's really, really difficult to navigate when you're using a screen reader um, to read these documents. So it's often completely inaccessible for individuals who use screen readers. So the thing I like about it is that it's openly accessible to the public. And when I think about the public, I also think about the people that we deliver our data to within our organizations. They still have that public focus, even though they're employees of our organizations or maybe neighboring organizations. But as a side effect, which is really, really useful, and I'm really happy that it's a side effect for me, is that it makes my data quicker to use. I don't have extraneous things that I have to clean because it's already set out for the benefit of somebody who needs to screen read. So every cell has something in it and it reads along. That also works for data analysis and data science. So please think about it for when you're develop when you're producing data in a, in a spreadsheet to share with people. And by implication at some point, I do hope, I'm not sure everywhere does it yet. For example, Office of National Statistics, weekly provisional, um, death data that was very, very important over the height of the COVID period, um, I don't think that was necessarily available in that format. Oh, share the link for the web page. Good point. I will share the link. Here we go. Also, um, I try to keep all the links just so that you're aware because it's quite useful to know. Uh, if we go to the NHSR community, oh, actually, if I go slowly, if I think about the community, NHSR community website, on resources, we've got, I've put links to the books that we have, so they go directly there. So you don't have to go to GitHub, particularly if you have restrictions from IT on GitHub. And Open Analytics Resources is a book that's built in Quarto. And if I put accessibility, I think it is, there are a few things, few links here, probably could do with a few more. Um, 
actually that is the government guidance for accessibility for website i think i need to put that particular link in there actually but uh, that's quite useful for keeping all the links and these are just things that i've collected over time and people can contribute to say things that are no longer available or things that i've missed so that's um on our website and i will share that but it is brilliant brilliant work that they're doing so when we import a messy data set, we're going to do the same thing before. Well, we can do two things. So previously we clicked in this on this button that looks like a spreadsheet with an arrow, green arrow to the right to get the drop down menu and then selected from there and then navigated to the file. To save the navigation to the file, which is a step that's not actually necessary, we can just click on the file that we require in the files tab. So this is useful if you've got a project set up and you can see all the files that you're going to use in that um, folder. So beds underscore data dot CSV, if you click on that one, you get a two option thing. The view file opens up a, a tab in the space. I've had to set up my new uh, my cloud space completely afresh because I was trying to work out what the problem was yesterday. So it doesn't look like we had yesterday with things like Quarto or anything set up. So that's why I've just got these three panes again. So if I did the view file, you can see it in its raw CSV format, which isn't particularly helpful. But if we click on beds underscore data and select the second option, which is the import data set dot 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 wizard again, but this time it knows the file that we require. So we don't need that step, which is good. Now on my screen, it's a bit squashed because um, I'm using half a screen. Actually, I need to change my settings as well i forgot about that but um this bit you can't quite see either let me see if i make this bigger what we can see is a data preview and that the column headers are taking metadata at the top so this is what i mean about being accessible so if a person can see this they can go to the bit that they want to but if they're using a screen reader they have to go through each section and it, it is quite meaningless when you get to dot 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 three dot 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 four so the thing about are when you import data and data frames is that it doesn't allow for um, column names that are repeated and it doesn't allow for null values. These are missing values. So it puts in something just to make it clearer. So we're getting source metadata in the top few rows. And what we're looking for is line three, which has the column headers that we require. So you may have done this before importing data, maybe into say SQL SSMS, or maybe even into Excel from something else like CSV files, you can skip the rows. So you type in three in skip and then press return or tab or click off the into a different page. And it updates both the preview. So it moves all your files, all your data up. And it also updates the code for you, which you can, if just to remind you, you can copy and paste individual lines, or you can use this notepad icon to copy all three lines. So the other thing before we finish in this import data set, you can also do import date is, uh, that's the metadata, did that bit, is we have to be careful about dates. And to be fair, dates are usually a problem in all manner of, um, data software so I can see behind me and I was wondering what was behind me <laughs> and it's the road so I got distracted by the road um yes yeah, so dates can usually get catch us out particularly because we use UK formats uh, with UK data and software is built using US formats which is what's happening in this case so our data is coming in with this format of a quarter date so it's usually the beginning of the month so the first of the ninth 2013 and I suspect at some point there's a date that isn't a real date if you think of it in a US date format so it's overwriting it and making it a character so if data cannot be automatically assessed as being say double or integer or number or date, it goes to character or text or string. They're also known as. If you click on the box where it says date, um, you get a drop down menu and you can select what format you want it to be. And we want a date. So I'm going to pause here just to make sure that everybody gets this particular bit because we're going to use dates later. And if we don't change the format, we can change. It's not going to work necessarily how we're working and uh, going to use these dates. So this date string is saying, what do we want? What is the data? Sorry, not what do we want it to be? What do the date formats look like? And at the moment, it's defaulting to US month, day, year. 
and we need to swap that round to the UK date format, which is day, month, year. So I'm telling it, this is what the data looks like. When I click OK, we get a lot of code in the bottom. So there's a lot of information down there, which we can just copy and put into our code scripts. And the date format changes in the preview to the universal date format. It says it's a date type, but also it's year, month, and day. So it's unambiguous now. And you may find if you work with SQL servers that your dates are stored in that, so they're unambiguous. And if there's a different date that comes in accidentally, that's a US date format that can't fit our dates, it throws it out because it doesn't recognize it as a date. I have been asked, and I think this was a really great question, how do I make this look like what I see in Excel or Power BI or maybe even Tableau or Clicks do the same where it's got the format that we're, we got the data in originally? So I did ask my colleague uh, who does computer science and is a bit of a whiz with computers, and he said, you can do it, you can change it, but you have to change your computer settings for it to be viewed in that format for you on the screen. But what we can do for outputs for other people is we can change the formats and we can make that any format we require, like we could make September the word instead of the number. So my recommendation is not to change your computer settings. I don't actually know how to do that because I stopped at that point is become familiar with year, month, day format, because that's unambiguous, and it's the international universal date format as an analyst or data scientist or person working with data. But then when you think to, about reports, you have the, the capacity and the capability to change those to more friendly, recognizable dates. Anyway, I will copy this line of code and cancel that. But because I deleted my well, I just had a fresh, fresh setup. I'm going to go to quarto document dot, dot, dot and do my report. Oh, that's not right. It's a title. So make it proper. Put my name in. And I'm going to go right to the bottom. And because I haven't actually loaded tidyverse, so I did the forward slash and I'm going to press return in the visual mode of Quarto so that I get the first option is R code. I'm going to write li oh, actually, I'm going to write library tidyverse, but I've just realized it won't be in here, but I'm going to paste my code in because I didn't have that. So if I run this, it won't. Oh, it does have tidyverse. Oh, of course it will. Sorry, I took a copy. So all my settings from yesterday are not there, but I'll go to tools, global options, and just change my appearance. So it's a bit bigger on the text font and dark mode. Again, if that's still not useful for people, please do let me know if you can't view it very well. I'm going to change my settings so that the inline code here is removed and it just appears in the console. So that was in the cog and chunk output in console. Remove output, yes. And also I want it in the preview pane. So when I render this, I need to save my file and I'm gonna call it my report, but with no spaces. So it appears as my report.qmd, but I will get my folder because I didn't change my YAML. So this is all afresh. I might just change that though. Ooh, it's interesting. What's going on here? Oh, I can't seem to get to the end of my editor options. I don't know what's going on there. That's very strange. Right, embed. Oh, my computer's gone a bit strange. Let's see if my inserts, no, nope. render. I'm just going to have to do F5, I think, to refresh the browser because it's gone a bit strange on the view. But now I've removed my folder by putting embed resources equals true. I'm just going to F5 my whole posit cloud because it's doing something strange with my cursor. I think that's a browser thing. Yeah, now it's gone back to normal. Right. So I have copied this code. I'll put this into the chat, but hopefully you have had a go of use, at using the wizard to import that by directly clicking on the file that you require and importing it. To view the data, there's a couple of options. So if I look at the environment, this is within your workspace as opposed to when you render it as a report. There's a, an object, which is the global name for things that appear. And this is a data frame and specifically a tibble, which is like a 
an addition it's got additional metadata or viewing capabilities as a tibble rather than data frame so it's building on a data frame we can explore the information by clicking on the little blue circle with an arrow which then points downwards giving you the data column names and mine's a bit squashed you get a few of the uh, top level data but if you click on the beds underscore data as it should be but mine's squashed itself it will open up the view in your as a tab in your R Studio, and we can see the code that was run for that button in a sense where we clicked on the link is the code that appears in the wizard which is view brackets beds underscore data now the reason i don't copy that and put it into this so if i just copy that must be careful about these arrows because they're not part of the code they're part of the command line but if i copy the code and put that into my chunk and then render that it should break and the reason why it's breaking is because view is changing something in your r studio it's opening a tab these are two separate environments really and it gives you that flexibility but it could be confusing things look one way in your r studio quarto document and look another way depending on what your output is whether it's a word document or a pdf so when you're saying open up a tab i want to see the data in your code that's not going to show very well when you're opening up a, an HTML report, for example. You don't really need that uh, to view it because you can click on in this environment, click on beds, but also if you wanted it to appear or just so that we can see it in the console as we're working in this workspace, if you start typing beds underscore data, it gives you the option options that are available and this one only has beds underscore data, tells you it's in the global environment and gives you this, this is quite new to the latest R studios where it gives you a preview of the data itself. But if I just do tab or return key, it fills in the rest of the information and you can run that line of code. So if I, at the moment in Quarto, press the run key, so that's there's a run button with a white square with a green arrow to the right or control and enter, ooh, uh, run selected lines. I think I have to click on it to do that option. Control and enter is my favorite way of doing this. It appears in the console as it does on the slide on the left. And you can see the top 10 and that's the tibble aspect of it. So it says at the top, a tibble gives you the numbers of rows or observations and five columns, which are also known as variables. If you look in the top right of your environment pane, it only shows you the top 10, which is quite nice. Um, it can be restrictive. You can then print more, but a data frame will give you them all. And as you can see, 4,558 is a lot to scroll through. So Tibble makes it nicer to look at in the console. Are there any questions from that? I'm not going to do from the web. It was very difficult to find an example from it, but it's using the same wizard. So feel free to have a look at that at another time. Just follow those slides. So the next section we're going to launch into is now Sorry, we've got a quick yes, question. Go for it. Go ahead. Um, so you said the view, having the view thing um, breaks the execution of your quarto document. If you wanted to, could you still keep it in there but comment it out and run it and that would be fine? Yes, so you that's still fine. have your code the way you want it, but yes. it doesn't break your. Yes, that's one way around it. I never really use that code itself in my script because when I look at the data that's that's something that I may or may not do um, so it's more of an act so what I was saying very early on yesterday was everything that's in our studio has code behind it so what they're doing is giving you the code in the wizard to load your package which is Redar, which we already had through tidyverse import your data and then view it straight away so it's giving you that code as a very new user, let's say, but as somebody who's producing a report or doing further analysis, you may be looking at your data, maybe in the console or in the, so I don't keep that bit. That's a bit like save. I don't put a uh, code for saving, for example. I just always save my files. Incidentally, because it's a quarto document, we have automatically needed to save it to render it into something else, but it's the same shortcut Oh, it looks like it's already been saved. Maybe I saved it automatically. You can save as. These are the same shortcut keys and the same functions that you could use or menus 
that you can use in Microsoft products as an example. So you just control save, but I don't write that as code, if that makes sense. So when I view my table, my data frame, I'm just using like a save function. I just look at it. But if you wanted it, you can add it in, that's fine. But comment it out, good point. So cleaning the data with dplyr, we did a little bit when we did the wizard. It says in this area what the column types are and the column format specifically for the dates having been changed to day, month and year and the skip information. But we might want to do some more work with it to put it into a position, um, a data format or um, I'm just trying to think of the words without using the actual words that I'm going to. Im so we need to sort of manipulate or shape our data depending on what we're going to do, whether that be statistics or visualizations. Um, and this is an image from Alison Horst to try and explain, I think, the word wrangling, which is used quite a lot in our terms. It might be used more widely in programming, I think, particularly for data. And this depiction is of dplyr as a friendly kind of green fluffy thing with the data being a bit unruly, which is kind of what our data is like, and trying to shape it and control it using this wrangling idea. Oh, it says on the slide, actually, I forgot about this. It's the shaping or transforming of data. So we've got various words to try and viscerally, I suppose, explain what we're doing with the data, trying to get it into a format that's easier to work with. And when people say it's the largest part of analysis and data science, they often quote 80%. I don't know quite how that was worked out, but it does feel like the majority of the work we do has a lot of data cleaning. That's the other way of referring to it. But what we're trying to often do is take our data that's set in a particular way and changing it for the way that the machines can operate. So there's kind of human readable and machine readable in my head, but they follow this process of a thing called tidy data which was written by Hadley Wickham in a journal of statistics. He went into greater detail about what we mean by tidy data, that each variable is a column and each observation forms a row. And the way I try to explain this a bit more, because that's kind of quite abstract, is that when we get our spreadsheets often from sources like ONS, as I mentioned, the provisional weekly death data, and maybe we provide data to others, we tend to do it in a very human friendly way. So in a context of a patient being in several wards, we'd have one patient per row and we'd read along. So we'd have ward A, whether they were in ward B, ward C, ward D, and it would be each column would be each ward. Now that's not often how data is stored within SQL servers. That's how we often give data or read it as humans. The way we want it for machine readable when we're gonna use statistics or visualizations is machine friendly, long data. So the patient would be repeated depending on the um, on the ward that they're in, one column for the ward rather than several. And the patient A would be ward A, patient A, ward B, patient A, ward C is much harder to read as a human, but that's the format that we're looking for when we talk about tidy data, and then we can do stuff with that data. So people who come from SQL backgrounds or using SQL relational data often see that data in that format. I'd use data in that way without realizing it had a name. And I think what Hadley Wickham did was write it down and just point out, based on quite a lot of the SQL things that we do, um, he just put it down onto paper, which is great. So the dplyr package is part of the tidyverse and it's used a lot for data manipulation. There are many, many functions within it that can help with it. A lot of what we do in terms of wrangling, as it's called, or cleaning, can be solved with just a few of them, which is what we're going to cover today. And many of these concepts, and actually the ones I'm not even necessarily going to go into, uh, come from SQL. So there's a lot of overlap. So what I do quite a lot, actually, I guess if you're learning another language, particularly a European language, you may say, think, well, what's this word? in Latin or, or does this sound like English when I try and translate it? It's a little bit like that between dplyr and SQL I found. So it's like lead and lag, for example, do they exist in SQL? Yes, they, in SQL, I mean, do they exist in dplyr? Yes, they do. And so there's this overlap often in the words and sometimes in the cons and quite often in the concepts. There are other packages that can extend it and there are other functions as well, but we're going to cover four here and we're also going to add in a few other functions as we go along. A function is always denoted by round brackets at the end of a word with no spaces between them. 
Interestingly, I found that it doesn't break if you have that space, but it's good practice not to have spaces in your code. So we're going to look at some functions that may make sense when you look at them straight off, arrange and filter. You could probably hazard a guess, as they say, as to what they will do. But we're also going to look at mutate and summarize, which may not be so clear, particularly when you first look at them. Mutate, for example, is a strange word. The dplyr package allows for US and UK spelling, and they do exactly the same thing. So summarize can be spelt with an S or a Z. And in ggplot2, if you write color, you can do that with a U or without, and it will do the same thing, which is really nice. It's very open for that. So a lot of coding tries to bring what's quite abstract into uh, real world scenarios. So this is, I guess, this is where I get stuck, is it an analogy rather than a metaphor of what we do with our code when we're using dplyr with data, but we're going to use it in the context of a recipe and making mashed potatoes. I have heard of things like code recipes as well, that's used quite a lot. So people use these words interchangeably for their code and back out again into the real world in a sense. So functions, as I've referred to them, where they have the brackets around them and they do things, they're also known as verbs in terms of uh, dplyr because they're doing things. But that's just a kind of um, colloquial term in the world of tidyverse, I guess. Often they're called functions, but they're known as verbs as well. Each step is a line of code in a recipe, and those steps can be repeated like in a recipe, um, but the order matters. And just to point out that when I was much, much younger, I tried to mash potato before boiling. And so order really matters both in the real world and in coding. So when we break this down, which is a recipe, just to go through it, potato, peeling it, slicing it, boiling it, mashing it, that's to my younger self. Unfortunately, I didn't know that at the time. Um, when we take this and try and sort of like make it look like code, what we would do is take the potato, which we would refer to as the object. That's the global name for a potato in this context, rather than data. And then we're using a little symbol, which I will explain because that has changed over time as well. Or there are two different symbols that we can use. The next action is to peel that action or verb or function. This is a function, peel, we've got brackets around it and there's nothing else in there because we just peel. We don't peel faster or slow or higher. We just peel it. And we have functions that are like this where they just have no other things written inside them. But with slice in this context, we do have something written inside. We refer to these as parameters or arguments. Um, and in this context with slice, we're looking at the size being medium. And medium is text, it's a string, or uh, there's another word I've used for text, I've just forgotten what it is, and that's within quotation marks. And those quotation marks in R can be double or single, so just so long as they match, it doesn't mind which one it is. And this symbol can then be that word then as well, it was above, so then, we're doing a next step. So you haven't finished your recipe. You take your potato, then you peel it, then you slice it then you boil it. And in this context, we have an argument of time, which is numeric. So it doesn't have quotation marks around it because it's a number, 25 representing 25 minutes. And then we mash it, it's a final action. Now this um, symbol is known as a pipe, which is a bit confusing because that particular symbol that we talked about yesterday, the up and down, which has various um, detail uh, various names is also called a pipe in keyboard uh, which I hadn't kind of appreciated because I used pipes in R for a long time and this is quite new in Quarto but a pipe is a particular layout so it's um, a percentage sign with an arrow to the right and a percentage sign and it comes from a different package altogether from tidyverse but it's part of it so as you load tidyverse you also get this thing called magritar Magritar is a play on the artist Magritte, who said this is not a pipe, and this is not a pipe. It's not a real pipe, so it's a play on that word. Now, the pipe can be brought no matter, I'll show you what it looks like differently now, but if you do Control, Shift, and M, you get this pipe, which has a percentage sign, arrow to the right, and percentage sign. But the new one, which is relatively new, I say new, um, 
probably about a year or so old. This is called base R pipe. So you no longer need to install a package to be able to get a pipe. So it does the same thing. It's the Magritte R pipe is a little bit more powerful, but I think in the early stages, you are not necessarily going to require that power. It, 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 the, they're both sufficient for what we're doing with analysis. So if you go to tools and global options, uh, does the pipe only work in the R script? It works in R, Quarto, it, wherever you've loaded the packages. So it wouldn't work in a different language, but anything to do with R that's loaded, either Tidyverse or you load the package itself, Magritar, yes, it would work. I think if I haven't, yeah, do let me know if I have misunderstood your question though. So if we go to code, which is the second option, and it matches what we've got on the screen, and then go to fourth one down, use native pipe operator. So it requires a particular version, so 4.1 plus of the R program, not R Studio, to be able to do this. So if you go back to your own computers and you've already got R and R Studio loaded, but you can't see this option in R Studio, or you've got an earlier version of R, you might not be able to use this, but that's okay. You can still use the Magritar pipe. And when I now do control shift and M, I get just the pipe and strangely it includes a pipe itself and the arrow to the right. Now that doesn't need any loading of packages, as I say, so you could just open up an R script or a Quarto script and it will just work. But it's often used in what we're doing with dplyr. So you'll need dplyr to be able to do that go from one thing, then another thing, then another thing. So we're going to use these in combination to solve or to explore some data questions. And the first one, they're quite long, they need to be broken down, is which organization provided the highest number of mental health beds? And I'm going to put this into a new chunk just so that I can run the chunk. So I'm going to do a forward slash and do a return so I get my um, R chunk. So if I write beds underscore data, I just wrote bed and it gives me the option. Then if I do tab, it finishes the word for me. Now, if I do control shift and M, what happens neatly is that it puts spaces between your code and sets it out neatly. The code will run all on one line with no spaces, but it's not very easy to read. So the tidyverse style is to make it readable for humans as well. So if I write arrange beds underscore AV, I can either run the entire chunk by using the um, green button to the right or just have my cursor anywhere in the code and do control and enter or run selected lines if it's got that option for you. So you don't need to highlight the entirety of it. You get the top 10 answer in the console. And as I was saying before, if I have everything all squashed together, it runs as well. And that's fine, but it's not that easy to read. So I'm just going to put those spaces back in. So the top 10 shows the arrange. So it's a bit like sort or order by, and you get your beds average column from the lowest to the highest. That's not actually answering our question because we wanted the highest number. What we can do is put another function around it called desk, which is short for descending. What I really like about our code is that if you highlight the word and start with an open bracket, it closes it around it. So instead of over typing everything that you would probably find in Notepad or in Microsoft Word, it recognizes that you're going to put in the a corresponding um, punctuation mark, whether that's the quotation mark or, an, or a bracket. So that's quite neat. And then if I put between the two opening brackets, desk and then do control and enter, I get my code, my data back, but I now have it the other way around, which is what I was looking for with the highest number of beds average to the lowest. We see the top 10, so we only see the top part of it. These brackets can get quite confusing because there's a lot of them. So if you wobble your mouse over the closing bracket of one of them, just to see what it matches, you can see it sort of highlights it slightly. And that can be useful. But the other thing you might like to do, if you go to tools and global options, there are lots of options in here. And code, go to display option. And I'll just pause so that people can follow that. There are two things at the bottom for syntax. 
The first one is highlight the R function calls. If I apply that, you can see that the colors, the, the function name that's next to a bracket, that's what triggers it, is colored blue, which is very much like the SQL view that I showed in appearance. But also with rainbow parentheses, and if I apply that, it changes the colors of the brackets. And now you can see as a visual cue what matches. So the pinks match and the orange match, max, ma matches. I can't seem to say that. That works for all of the types of brackets. So curly brackets, square brackets, rounded brackets. They're not for ev to everybody's taste and the colors can be conf not great for everybody, but I find that quite useful as a visual indicator that they match to each other. So feel free to change that back if that's something that you're not too keen on. The next question is to you, first of all. Are there any questions from that or anything else that you'd like to explore? Because now we're going to explore the data a little bit more by extending the question about um, the highest numbers of mental health beds, looking for two organisations in a particular date period, which is why the date was important for us to make sure it was in the right format. So we can use a range as we did before to get the highest number. So we're building on the previous slide, but we require only the observations in September 2018. And we can do that. I'm going to use the same chunk by getting our data again, beds underscore data, press return, it fills in the details, control shift and M does the pipe with the nice spacing. And also a nice other couple of things is this visual indicator that the data the date data always comes a little bit over and is indented to the function so you can see that they match up to each other but also our studio does this for you automatically you don't have to tab it over and if we write filter it recognized it and i did a tab and it did the brackets for me so i didn't have to type them it's just a short amount of just a small amount of um not typing but then if i do date equals equals and I will explain what the equals equals is and why it's required but just type out 2018-0901 and control and enter to get that data. So what's happening is it's a test of equality when you use equals equals. A single equals in R predominantly means an alias, a naming, an as type thing or function and we will use that in a later function. But when we're going through the dates, we're saying, does this date match true? Does this match false and true and false and, and so on? And then only bringing back the true. The bit that I moved on to with forgetting what's coming next on my slide is to do the negative of that. So where we want it not to be there, we want to exclude a data, a date. And how we do this, I'm going to copy those two lines of code. And I think it's control shift and arrow down to copy it. So that's a nice um, shortcut key. That was shift alt, sorry, not control. I said control. Shift alt and the downward arrow having highlighted what I wanted to copy. And instead of doing equals equals, it's an exclamation mark and an equals. So we can see that this was the first returned information. There were fewer rows and they all say, at least in the top 10, the 1st of September. But if we're going to exclude the 1st of September, we get fewer rows than the original, which is 4,000, yeah, 4,558, we get 4,341, and we only see the top 10, which are not, they don't match. But we know that something's happened because the rows have reduced. Now in SQL terms, for those who use SQL, I used to use the negative quite a bit. And computationally, I think it was, um, a little bit slower. So people in SQL prefer to always make things a positive a thing in their code. Whereas R, I don't think it has any noticeable issue with it. So you can be quite negative in how you're working with data, which is quite useful, I found. And there's a few examples of that as we go along. Now, if we put the two things together, uh, why am I getting outputs in the R script instead of the console? So when you go to the cog next to render in your Quarto document, if you click on that, what you'll probably find is your tick is on the preview. No, not that one, sorry. Pre chunk output inline is ticked. 
And if you only want it to be in your console, click chunk output in console. You'll get a message flash up to say, do you want to remove what you've already got in your report in line? And you can say yes, and it will remove those for you. I find it a bit distracting because they can get quite long. So I like it only to be in the console, but you it's a personal preference, but it's in that cog. Let me know if that hasn't worked and we can try and problem solve or I was going to say, yeah, it's problem solve rather than debug. So what I'm going to do now is combine the two functions really that we've worked. One was sort, uh, filtering and one was ordering. If I write beds underscore data and tab, so it does the rest of the words for me, control shift and M for Mike for the pipe, go on to the next line. Now this is a very small data set, so it doesn't really matter whether we arrange first and then filter, but computationally on say millions and millions of rows, we put filter first, but it doesn't necessarily matter logically in this context. So filter date equals equals 2018-09-01. And it's good to run it just to make sure that, that bit runs. So I've run this particular two lines of code and I'm getting just 2018-09-01 back. If I go to the end of that line and do control shift and M and my cursor's right next to the arrow again, but it gives you the spaces around it. And then type arrange. And we're going to do descending. And another bracket, which is coming up as orange on mine, and AV. And then if I do control and enter, even though my cursor's right at the end, it will run. And I've now got it ordered. So if I show you the one above, you can see it came just randomly how it was in the data. Manchester was at the top. I don't know what the full details were. And now it's East London and Nottingham that appear at the top in 2018-09-01, September. Can I just check that you're okay with the console, Juan? Is that all right? Sorry, I've got something different in the console. I'm wondering if that's... Do you want to show me? Is. Yeah, are you okay showing your screen? Oh, um, yeah, sure. Uh... Uh, sorry, I've never had shared my screen. Yeah, it's okay. Zoom, so I don't in, know my screen. In Zoom, that somewhere, depending on how your setup is, it, it moves around. There'll be a green oh, okay. button. Okay. You found that bit. But then you have to do it twice. So you kind of have to go, yes, share the screen. Yes, I want to share this screen. <laughs> so it's, um, Teams just allows you to do it straight away. Oh, it's doing it now. That's it. Oh, you can see me. There we go. Okay. Okay, could you just repeat the action that you took then? To Oh, that's me again. So if you just show me what you did, because you're quite right, the um, the data showing really the, f the first bit. Yep, so what I, I, th I think your code's right. So you run the first chunk above, so lines 59 to 60. I think that's what you're seeing in... Uh, no, that's not right, is it? That makes no sense. Oh, so your code that you've just run above it, I don't. Oh, it's because it's got not equals. So line 70 says not equals. So you're not getting 2018.09. It's running that code, but you need it to be equals equals. Yeah, the top one, control enter. That's fine. There you go. So it was a... Uh, it was the notation, it said not equals. Yeah, and thank you. Cool. cool, thank you for sharing. And let me share my screen. I always forget that bit to get my chat. Okay. Now, what we said in the question was find the top two. So we can see the top two. We can see it's East London and Nottinghamshire. I, I know this one because I used to work there. It's Nottinghamshire Healthcare. But for coding purposes or maybe a report, we might just literally want the top two, not just like we can see the top two and then type them out. We actually want that in code. And what we can do is add, and what you can see here is I've actually got them the other way around on this, where I got the arrange first, so it doesn't matter. It will still give the same information. If you go to the end of your arrange and do control, shift, and M for the pipe, and use a function called slice. So I'm going to pause at slice, and you can see all of these options in dplyr for slicing. So in SQL, 
I'm not sure in Excel, but certainly in SQL, you'd use like top um, number. So select star select. I've forgotten now completely, but <laughs> uh, comp select top two star. I think it would be from the data set that you're using. And in Excel, you'd have to highlight and use your mouse and copy and paste. But in code in R, particularly in dplyr, you can take the top slice head, which is what we're going to do, the top two. You could do the top bottom, or as it were, the top bottom. That makes no sense. You can take the bottom numbers. You can take a sample and min and max. But we're going to use slice head. N equals is the number. We're doing a parameter or an argument. What is the number that we require? So we need the top two, N equals two. And then if I do control and enter, I can share that code as well, which is slightly wrong way around on this way round. Oh, no, hang on. I just share that. So I share the code as well if you need. So that will just give you the top two. So just to check that that's OK with everybody. So the code I've shared in the chat has the filter second to the arrange. Uh, does filter work in the same way as select? No. So filter changes the rows of data and select changes the columns of data and what you're returning. We will cover select though. That's in the next sort of chapter after maybe a break that we have. But because the functionality in R for select is much wider than SQL. So we're now going to explore a couple of the other functions that I showed you or verbs. Uh, which organization has the highest percentage bed occupancy in September 18? So breaking the question down, we've used a range which found the highest and that was kind of, you could probably assume what a range was going to do and you could assume what filter was going to do because we wanted to restrict and we have done by September 2018 quarter because this data is in quarters. But we don't have the percentage variable in the data. So if I look back at this line here or this this short data set, we've got actual numbers for averages for beds and occupancy, but not percentage. So we need to create a new variable, which is where this verb and function called mutate comes in, which is a strange sounding uh, word, really. You can't necessarily guess what it does from its own from its name. Now, I'll just write the first bit out as I type it. So beds underscore data, press return. So we do this repeatedly. Control, shift, and M for Mike for the pipe. Go on to the next line. And if I write to mutate, then the brackets, if I do the open bracket, it closes it for me. And what I'm doing here is using an equals rather than an equals equals, which is a test of equality. This is like an alias or an as. It's a naming. I'm naming a new column. So I'm going to call it something else, actually. I'm going to say percentage oc, just to show that you can change this to whatever you like. Try to make it meaningful because it's good to good practice to make it meaningful. Um, but sometimes I think this is probably a bit long when I say percentage underscore oc. Oc underscore av, if I start typing that, it finds it and gives me the options to it. So I will do that. And I'm going to put spaces. You don't necessarily have to do that between your division, but I'm going to do that for, ooh, I've made it capitals, which is a bit shouty. AV, can't type AV now. And so give this a bit more space because you can't see it on my screen because it says here, which is a Tibble thing to do, to say one more variable and then give you the name, the full name of that column, which is nice because you can't see everything in the console. So Tibble shows you what you can't see in the columns, but I've given it a bit more space in the view. Um, and now when I've run it again, you can see the extra column that we've got, the sixth column called percentage underscore oc with some numbers in there. So this is not a test of equality. If you forget and do equals, you get a, a message saying it's not available. I forgot to show you the mistake in the previous one. So if I removed equals in the filter, which is a test of equality, and I made that, I'm going to break it. It gives you a hint because this is a very common thing. I still do it now. And it says, did you mean date equals equals? So these have been coded by the posit team, the tidyverse developers in the, and it says error very clearly, but not in red because that's not very accessible to individuals, some individuals. So going back to mutate, 
which I've accidentally broken by putting two equal signs. Um, so this is now adding a column. So in Excel, what you would do, say if you've got it all set out and it's it's a, just thinking about it. So you set it as a table, your your data, and you add a column, it adds that into your table and then you just start typing. So how you create your addition to your table is by typing in your information. In SQL, it's a several action process that we're doing with Mutate. We're taking our data frame, we're changing the data frame. And in SQL, you would say, add a column and it would have this data type and it would, um, you're preparing your data frame and then you add in your data. So Mutate is doing that two-step process in more SQL terms than say Excel, but Excel does it even easier really because you type your words and then you created an added column. So mutate is changing the structure of your data frame and telling the system what to put into it, which is this percentage based on occupancy and beds average. We can then filter it because we've now created that. Um, we could filter it before, actually, to be fair, because they don't actually interact. But if we do filter date equals equals, this was after putting in the function at the back as well not function, sorry, I was trying to do two things at once. I forgot my words. After putting in the pipe at the very end of this code, so it can read then so that they're related to each other. 2018-09-01 to get the date, go to the end and control shift and M for pipe and go to arrange. And so these are the things that we did before with descending, but this time I'm going to do it by percentage occupancy. And as you can see, because I called it percentage oc, that's what I have to refer to because that's the new column that I'm arranging by. So I will share the code. Oh, it doesn't share it. Let's see if I can, there we go, that's interesting. Share that code with you from the slide. So we can now see the percentage occupancy is ascended, it um, ascends from, or descends, sorry, from the highest to the lowest, and there are two at the top. I taught this for, many months and then I started to realize how important it is to see the numbers behind your percentages. It was one of those things, it's so obvious when you see it, but I was seeing it repeatedly and I missed it. These are two distinctly different services. So Royal Free London, it was very easy to get to 100% occupancy because there were only two beds on average. But Oxley's had 384 beds. So to have 100% occupancy sort of shows a completely different service. So now I'm very reluctant to just put just percentages out there. I want to know what does that base on? Is it a percentage of a lot or is it a percentage of very little? And that can be really useful to have that knowledge alongside your percentages. It's one of those things that when you look at your data repeatedly, things come out of it, even years later. So what was the mean number of beds for the data set? We're going to go into a different question. And we're going to look at the very last function that we suggested we'll go through which is a summary statistic. And I'm launching into this and I haven't actually checked first of all, is everybody okay with mutate and the filter and arrange that we've covered so far? Any questions, please do shout up or put them in the chat as you've been doing and I really appreciate those. Okay, so we're gonna look at summary statistics like the mean. Now R is a program that was built, it's a programming language that was built by statisticians. <clears throat> so it's pretty good at statistics. And we're going to use summary statistics. And we're going to apply it in a way that is not meaningful in statistics to our data, but to show how it works uh, programmatically and work towards making it meaningful in statistics. We're going to apply a mean to the entire data set, for example to start off with, which isn't very meaningful because we're looking at all dates, all areas, and that doesn't really make much sense. But we want to explore the function. So I'm gonna start off on a new line. I'm gonna take beds underscore data, which is the data object, control shift and M for the pipe, next line. And I'm gonna use it in the UK spelling with an S, but you can use it with a Z. There's lots of options for summarize, but I'm just going to use the top one. And this again is a name, so you can call it whatever you like. And I'm gonna stick with mean beds because I can't think of anything else <laughs> to call it because that's quite, quite a good name. Equals, so it's only one equals, and then I'm gonna use a function called mean. And then to do that on the beds average column. And when I do control and enter, 
I get a tibble of one by one. So what Summarize is doing, um, returning NA, which is equivalent to null in SQL, not available or not applicable. It's uh, probably a blank cell in Excel. Uh, it's taking a data set and applying the mean statistic to the entirety of it and just returning one number. We're getting NA and I'll explain why, but it's also not meaningful in a statistical term, but it does work. What's happening is we are doing a mean statistic on missing values, which are the NA. So if I just, actually what I'll do is write in the console beds underscore data. And if I press return, you can see just the object that we've imported. Oh, it's lost all its um, formatting now, which is a bit awkward. Sorry, let me just try again. We can see the format here. We've got lots of missing values in there. Just to say all the information that we've worked in this area in the script has not changed the data that we've imported and it does not change the data that it's been imported from. You can do that, but that is code that's specifically done. So this is kind of temporarily. Uh, so in SQL terms, you would probably, this would be your data that you just run as a script. And these would be all the temporary tables, these data frames that are appearing as objects. So we're not changing any of the underlying data. And we can see there are lots of NAs, missing values in there. We, when we apply a mean statistic, um, we are including NAs in there um, as default, but they just return an, an NA. I think it's a, I'm no mathematician, but I assume it's like applying infinity to it. It would come back as infinity. So it just, rem it, it just returns NA, which is the correct answer, but it's not a useful one. What we need to do is remove those NAs. And so you may think quite rightly that you can filter it out, which you can do, but the statistic itself, this function does allow for the NAs to be removed within it because it's kind of key in statistics. So in the mean brackets, which is the function, the beds underscore AV is a parameter that we've given it, which is what column are we applying the statistic to. But now we're going to do something else with it and we're going to do NA which refers to these NAs, dot RM, which in coding terms is remove, equals true. You can just do T, as you can see, it changes to orange in my color coding, but you can write true out. I like writing it all out because it's clearer. And if I do control and enter and copy that code for you to take as well, you can see we get a number back, which is correct, but it's not very meaningful but we get 300 because what we've done is dropped all of the NAs and then applied it. What might happen is that people uh, feel that they could um, or should recode it to zero. Now that will skew your statistic if you're using a mean or a median. So this is the better way. This is the correct way, I should say, not better. This is the correct way with statistics. If you've got something like a, a categorical variable as they call it, which is like a text. So you've got say gender or sex, and you're missing some values and you want to put in unknown, then there are functions to do that. And that's a reasonable thing to do. So think about your um, statistics separately to say categorical variables. I want you to have a go um, in your code. So what I'll do is I will ooh, copy out these into my own area and talk through them. Also give them to you so that you can take the skeletons of them. And what I want you to do is replace parts which would not work. So um, object, for example, needs to be corrected. What I would like you to do is instead of using the mean, which is what we've been using so far to get that number 300, to use the median. Give it a new name and find the column that you're looking for and then not to forget the na.rm. And then what we're going to do is repeat that in a separate section using sum, which is another statistic. And that one's um, got two columns that we're going to create in it because we're going to sum both the beds AV and the OC AV. They're separated by a single comma so that you can add more statistics to your data. Bear in mind that it changes the whole structure of your data frame. So it squashes it down to that one statistic. So you lose all this other information, but you're not going to use that on this occasion. You're just going to have a practice of replacing the mean for a median and then replacing that for a sum 
in a different context. I'll give you 10 minutes of me not talking for you to have some space and be here if you have any questions. Sorry, Zoe. Um, yeah. With the questions on the screen, when it says instead of me news median, and I'm assuming the object would be the bed data frame, That's right. um, the new name is whatever we want to call That's right. um, the new column we're creating. That's right. Um, the function then would be median. That's right. And when you've got column name, oh, it would be what a column that already exists in the data frame. Yes, that's right. You, okay. I mean, it doesn't matter which one you do, but oh, we right. were okay. using beds underscore AV, so you might want to see it as a median because it's beds average that you're looking for. So, all right. Okay. Actually, it's probably more appropriate for occupancy average, but we won't go into that. But yeah, that's right. Thank you. That's right.
Sorry, hi Zoe. Hi. So I've got a query. So I've, I think I've updated the the code, but in terms of the two, I think we've put both of the codes into one chunk. Yes. I was just trying to understand when you run the chunk. Basically, when I've run the chunk, it's only run the the second, which was the sum. But I, I'm not sure how that works. I thought when you run the chunk, it's everything in the chunk mm, yeah. that should run. So why is the media not actually coming up as well as the... Do you mind sharing your screen? Just unless so it's come up and I'm, I'm not understanding it. One yeah. second. <laughs> Let's have a look. Uh, yes. And I think that's the right one. Is that the right one? It's always a bit of a test of Zoom, isn't it? These things. Sorry, I don't know. Can you see the screen? No, not sorry. yet. No, you might. Yep, it's coming. Actually, sorry, it's slow. Right, I can see it now. Okay, yes, yeah, so it is. So what's happened is uh, if you just look at your console, yeah. you can see your output here at the bottom, the code above it relates to it. And that tibble that was one of one relates to the code above that. So ah, okay. it does code, answer, code, answer. Okay, so it's actually it run both of them the first yeah. one and the second so one so it has worked yeah. okay 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 thanks that's all right uh, how do you stop i'll i'll take it okay <laughs> there Cheers. we go i can take it back Okay, I hope you had a chance to go through that. I'll, I'll just go through and answer the query and, and write it out as I go along just to explain it. Um, so don't worry if you haven't finished it. And also I can share with you the answers so that you can compare if something wasn't quite working in your section, if that was the case. So where it said object, quite rightly was pointed out, we need to put beds underscore data as their object. That's the only object we've got actually, or I've got um, that we're gonna be working with. The new name, before I called it mean beds, I'm going to call it median beds. And instead of the function name as a placeholder here, and instead of mean, I'm going to write median. The column name I'm just copying above, actually, to be fair. Uh, beds underscore AV is the column I was looking at. Now, I paused when I was talking earlier about it. I can't do underscore. Because in mental health terms, median is really important, more so for things like length of stay. But it's kind of overlooked because if you're in mental health services in the hospitals, quite a lot of people are only in for a short amount of time. And there are people who are in for a very, very long period of time, probably more so than or longer than, say, accidents and emergency or admissions through um, 
emergency departments. So the median is much more appropriate for length of stay. Beds average, maybe not, um, but it was just to practice it. I've put in a bracket and actually that's going to break it. It needs to be a comma that's in this. That was an accident on my part and I don't know how I did that, but no brackets because the closing bracket needs to be after the na.rm. I've actually deleted both my brackets there. I'm going to put true. Now that cross has gone because all of those placeholders have been repeat, removed and when I do that you get the answer of 241. So I'll put that code in to the chat and let somebody in. Now median is really simple to do in R. I've done it in um, SQL and I've also used it in a pivot table I think in Excel. So it is possible to do them, but because R is designed specifically for, for statistics, but then you, it can be used for lots of other things. It's very flexible. Median is very easy to do. I'm sure it's the same in Python. Beds underscore data is the object again that we're going to repeat. And instead of doing, well, I'm going to call column one um, beds total. And OC, I'm going to put OC total instead to match these column headers, these column names. The function name is sum for both of these. Sum. And again, I'm going to get rid of these true. You see there's only one bracket here to close off this. So if I put my mouse over the, the cursor over the uh, closing bracket, you can see it relates to the sum function. And the second sum function has a closed bracket, but the overall closed bracket occurs at the bottom here. If I bring it back up and then do another return, it automatically um, indents it correctly because it was right over to the left because of the way I'd copied it actually from over here. Um, that doesn't matter where it is, it will work wherever you require it, but it's a section that will go through with code style just to make it readable or give you some visual cues that your code works. I haven't run it. I will run it and see we now get a tibble. So I've squashed the data set and these are actually more meaningful, I suppose. We've done two totals by the sides, by each side, totals of beds and totals of occupancy. The tibble also nicely shows the lines and so the, um, the hundreds and when you get into the bigger numbers, the millions and 100,000 million or whatever they go into, maybe millions even, billions. I don't know if we'd have billion data. That's a lot of data. It underlines so you can see it clearly in this console view. So that comes because it's a tibble. Were there any questions from those that particular exercise? That's great. People are working away, hopefully. I will try to make this more meaningful now in this section. So these numbers are all taking the whole data set and making one number. And it works programmatically, but statistically doesn't really make sense. So we need to apply the statistic to groups of data or sets of data in mathematical terms. So we can do that by either the um, meaningfully, either by the dates or by the organizations, that would make sense. And we know how to use summarize now to squash essentially the data set to give the number that we require, but we want to do it in this case, it, it's even more meaningful by each value of date. What's the mean or the median of beds or occupancy for all of the organizations in the date quarter that we've got. Now this has changed again quite recently so I'm going to show you the new way because I think that's really nice way to do it. And it doesn't get there's a bit of a confusing thing if you come from a SQL background for the old way. But the old way is still functional. You'll still see it in people's code. So I will show you that because you will see the two code kind of being used systematically in dplyr terms, um, anything in tidyverse. If things are move, if there's, if there's a move away from a function, it's not removed completely. What they have now is a badge system where they'll say it's deprecated and you'll get a message saying you're using a function that's deprecated, it's no longer supported. You might wish to use this new one. What we'll find where, where we're going through this with these group buys temporarily or permanently, there is they'll probably stay there for a while and not be deprecated as such. There's a question, sorry, so the mean and the median, what is the argument that reports to you the number of valid 
not NA values for estimations. Um, so it doesn't come from the mean. I'm not entirely sure what you're looking for for your mean and your median. So you're wanting to know what the number is. So if you've got a, a data set of 10 numbers and only eight are part of your mean, you want to know your denominator is eight. Is that what you're asking? I can see. Yes, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, that would be a separate thing that you would need to um, count, I think. You'd have to sort of count what numbers you've got left. So what you could do is, oh yeah, it's a good question. Um, I would have to filter the data to not NA and then count those or do a count function maybe of not NAs. Hang on, this is a good question. I think we might have um, total uh, number, let's say, count. And beds and scrawny. No, I'm doing a wrong function there. No, it's not a function that we do. Oh, I'd, I'd, I'd have to work that one out. I'll do that in the break because I think it's slightly different. It, with the mean and the median, you tend to just say this is the mean and the median, but it doesn't tell you necessarily. I'm not sure how meaningful that would be in statistics to say that we've actually dropped 50% of our data. That would be a separate thing that I'd be doing. I'd be saying the 50% of this is missing values. So that's a different question, if you see what I mean. But I will look into it because there may be, there is a function called count and I need to apply that somewhere to get that for you. But give me a second and I will do that in a break. So with that data, we've got these numbers, um, but we've got them as a total for everything or a mean of the entire data set, and we want to break them down by date. So if I take the beds underscore data, which is the object, control shift and M for the pipe, and summarize, which is the function, mean beds again, which you'll be familiar with, equals mean beds underscore AV, and we're removing the RMs equals true. So if I run that, you can see we get 300, which we recognize from previously. Before the end bracket, so this is part of the summarize pink bracket that I've got here, the summarize function. If I put in a comma, which means I'm going to add in a new argument or parameter and use dot by equals date and then do return a control and return. What happens is we get the same returned information. I'll put that code into the chat, but it's now broken down by each quarter. So it goes through each section and goes, you know, 1st of September, apply the mean statistic there. 1st of December, do the same again and goes through all of the information there. So these are like buckets or sets or groups of data. So it applies the statistic along the situation. This dot by is also available in filter and also in slice functions, just so that you know that it's all in other functions. And the reason why it's a dot, which is unusual, particularly in tidyverse and kind of in R, it's not used a lot. So we're using underscores rather than dots, which people may be familiar with, say, names that we're using or object names as we've got here, is because in this context, dot by is because it doesn't want, they don't want to clash with columns that are sometimes called by. I've never called a column myself by, but I, they do this because it's the likelihood is high that it could be misconstrued. So if we did by equals date, it could get mixed up between by as a column and by as the function argument. So the persistent grouping is a function in its own right using group by, but where it's a bit strange, particularly for those people who are from SQL code, is it doesn't do the same action as uh, it doesn't. It does a different concept altogether. So I got caught out by this when I came from SQL. So if I just write beds underscore data group by date, and then we'll look at the data. I'll just put that code into the chat. If we look at our groups here, it hasn't changed the data at all. The data is just exactly the same as before, which is not what happens in SQL. And all it says is groups by date. So it's preparing the data set in these groups. So anything that comes afterwards will be applied to those groups, which is why it's been renamed as persistent grouping. 
The issue that can arise from this is that you need to then ungroup sometimes because depending on what you've done to your data um, depends on whether that grouping has been removed. And that's where I got caught out. So my group, my data was all grouped. I did a few things and then it still did some strange things later because you need to then put ungroup onto it. You will see group by and ungroup in code. You'll see it in some of the things online for help. You'll also see um, it in other people's code, I'm sure. And it's just known as persistent grouping now. It can be useful, so I don't think it will be going anywhere. It's just that I find the temporary much easier to sort of explain, particularly to SQL users. A really important question now. Um, it is actually kind of break time. It's coming up to 11. So would you like a 10 minute break now? And then we've got a 10 minute um, question. I'll go through the questions I have done before give you 10 minutes to go through that and then give you the answer. But I think we probably could do with a break. I could do with a cup of tea and any questions. Got a thumbs up for a break. And I will have a look at that other question that you posed with my cup of tea about counting the valid NAs. OK, right. I will just pause if I can get Zoom to show up. So welcome back. I posted some code that's in the chat in answer to the question about how to count um, where and I'm trying to formulate the words because what I've done is I've, I've counted where they were null and where they were not null in a sense using NA. Um, so you're looking for the numbers, the denominator for any median or mean, but you can either do it by counting what you're removing or count what you have left. So I've added it to the beds underscore data. There are many different ways of doing this. This is just one particular way. Um, you could filter and then count them separately, but I've added it in. So actually, this is the wrong section, to be fair. Uh, it possibly would be better in the median code. So if I just copy that and then pop it into that, have I got too many brackets? I think that's fine. And so I've got my median beds, and now I've got numbers for what isn't an NA, NA, so the 241 is based on 1,373 um, data points. And what is, there's a lot of NAs, actually. It's a very good question because that's that's a lot of your data set is actually missing a value. Uh, but that's the entire data set that we were looking at. So a great question. Lots of different ways of answering it. And I just thought I would share that with you. Thank you for that. And what you didn't see, because I was doing it in the chat, was did a bit of a quick search. I looked at the count function, realized that's not actually very useful, and then went to Stack Overflow, which I will go through in one of the later slide decks to explain how to do some um, searching for things, because that's part of coding. It's not knowing everything. It's about knowing where to find the information. Oops. Oh, where am I doing? <laughs> going, going to a link. So now we're going to tackle, after getting a cup of tea and a bit of a break, a big question. I'll go through this, I'll break it down and then give you some time and space to work through it. Um, we're going to look finally at which organizations have the highest mean percentage bed occupancy. There's a lot in this question. <laughs> Train the trainer. It's brilliant. Um, and I'm going to summarize using the sum for the total beds and the total occupancy, which we have done already. And just to note as well that we were doing this uh, ex we have done this exercise for a number of months, a number of years, actually, for NHSR community. And somebody in the course was learning R, but knew their statistics a lot better and suggested that what we were doing previously was not actually strictly correct. So they suggested this use of total beds and total occupancy because we were assuming something in our previous course. So if you do go back and look at YouTube, um, what we did at this final exercise is slightly different. So in terms of train the trainer, always learning. Nobody has ever finished their learning. I think even Hadley Wickham, who has written some books on some stuff, is still learning because things are always changing. Right, so we're going to do the total beds and total occupancy, which we did before in a previous exercise. We're going to group those, but by organizations this time, not by t dates, but by organizations. And there are two columns in the data. If we do, if I highlight beds underscore data and just run that code, control and enter, you can see we've got org code and org name. And you, I suggest using the dot by function, uh, sorry, parameter within the summarize function. But if you have seen and want to practice group by, there's an answer for that um, separately. 
if you'd like to try using the group by verb function and then ungroup afterwards if you wanted to do that. And we're going to mutate. So we're going to create, summarize. So we're going to squash our data set to two statistics. And we're going to expand within that to each date. No, not a date, organization. I'll get there in the end. I'm glad the words are on the screen and I'm reading them all wrong. And then we're going to change and mutate that new data frame to have a new column, which will have the percentage based on the total of occupancy in beds. So that'll be occupancy divided by beds. And then arrange it at the very end. Let me just see, that's the solution. Quick stop. So uh, the solution is on that. So if you can, if you want the slides, you can look for the solution. I'll just give you the slides, that's fine. I'll give you 10 minutes to work through that. What I will do on my screen is make it a bit bigger so that you can see, well, maybe I won't. I will start by typing the functions out that we will use in that order. And I'll be here if you have any questions.
Okay, it's quite a tough question. There's a lot in there, um, but I will go through it and test my uh, own knowledge as I go through, and then the answers are on the next sheet anyway. So when we look at summarize, um, just checking the final code in the slides is grouping by the dot by function by date, not org. No, it's by organizational. Uh, but the slide's wrong. Well done. <laughs> just realized what you're saying. Yes. So the question and the answer don't match. I think I've picked that up, but I'd forgotten to update it. I think I put an issue on there. Yes. Don't worry if you've used date instead of org. Um, yes, there's a, a mistake in the answer. Let's see if I can make that mistake again when I'm doing it from memory. So I'm going to look at summarize first of all. I'm going to do total beds equals, and I need to sum. And I'm going to use the column beds underscore AV, NA dot RM equals true. So it may not be required, uh, but it's just, it's fine. If there are no NAs, then we'll miss it. I'm going to remove that um, pipe because, well, actually, I can use the pipe, can't I? Because somebody discovered this. If you use the pipe, but there's nothing in those uh, functions, this is how relaxed R can be. It just passes them through and nothing happens. And then you still get the answer that you've got. I didn't think it would do that. And somebody discovered that because we we're all learning with R. So you make assumptions that something will break and it doesn't, which is why I test stuff out, to see if it will break. So I've created total beds. I've got that answer in there. And now I'm going to create total uh, OC using the same format of sum OC underscore AV dot, no, bra get there in the end, comma na.rm equals true. And when I do control and enter, I get the two totals next side by side in a new data frame as such, because I've squashed the original to these two numbers. But I want to add in the um, organization uh, grouping, although the answer on the next slide says date. Sorry. So um, dot by equals and I'm going to do by organizational name. There is actually a slight difference between the two, but I'm going to do name because it just is a bit more meaningful. We get lots of zeros in here because, um, oh, I don't know why we get zeros actually, because we removed the NAs. So there's a lot of no information in totals, isn't there? That's an interesting feature of this. Need to explore that data a bit more to understand what's going on. So mutate is the next slide uh, next uh, code line and I'm going to take those new those two new columns the total beds and total occupancy and I'm going to mutate my data set to have a new column and I'm going to call it what am I going to call it I'm going to call it per, per uh, I'm making the percentage oh it's mean isn't it percentage uh, bed let's do percentage bed no what am I doing I'm doing highest mean percentage be bed occupancy so it's perk bed oc. I can't remember what I wrote for the answer. I'm hoping it was something like that. And I'm going to take total underscore oc and divide by total underscore beds. As I gave myself a little clue and also you, I hope, uh, to do this oc underscore beds. And if you did get to this bit doing it line by line and running it, which is good practice, I forgot to mention it. So well done if you did do that. You will see NAN as opposed to NA. So now we've got not a number. I think if you take a zero divided by a zero, you get infinity and it says not a number. So that's what NAN, which is equivalent in sort of statistical terms, I suppose, as to NA, but it is very precise in R what that data type is. I think in SQL, it'll just say null. And then I'm going to arrange by the percentage bed occupancy, but I'm going to do it in descending order because I want the highest. So I want perk bed oc, and it finds it actually as the top option in italics. Control and enter to run it. And I get Barnet Enfield and Haringey if you've used the names and Bradford District Care Trust as the two highest. So you were quite right, this is wrong. Um, it really should be org name or org code. And so how did I get on? I did, I called it bed oc. So I, I changed the name a little bit longer, made it a bit longer, but I did everything else the same. Now the group by function, I should click on the words, has a group by 
fungus. Sorry about the highlight. I need to change my highlight color. I haven't worked out how to do that yet. But change the group by, so we put in a function. Then the summarize is the same as before, but without the dot by feature. And then it doesn't require an ungroup by because the summarize function removes it for you. So that is if you wanted to do it by group by. But I was looking really to look to use this dot by feature, which is quite new and nice to use. Did anybody encounter any issues that they want to go through or any bits that didn't look quite right or different or any comments on what we just been working on? That's the last big exercise for the day on this, this course, just to bring everything together. And the next section we will go through, we'll just introduce, I'll go through the functions that I've got, uh, exploring them a bit more, one of them being the select, for example, I'll post them into the chat, type them out, and then also post them into the chat, sorry, I'll post them into the chat and type them out so you can see the outcomes and what they do. So there's a lot of functions and this course doesn't cover half of them for dplyr. But what we have used is really functional. You can get quite far with just these ones. But you'll be probably familiar with select, particularly if you've worked with SQL code or ever seen any code. It always starts off with a select function. Select star from is quite common to have seen. The select functions within dplyr do the same. And because they're functions in R, you can add to functions in R and the dplyr people, tidyverse, have added to them and made them even more powerful. So if I create a new chunk just to make it a bit clearer and separate it from the previous work. If we just take our object again, so beds underscore data, I press the return key to fill it in, control, shift and M for mic for the pipe. Go on to the next line and select org underscore code and org underscore name. This is very similar to the select features of SQL where you name the columns that you want to pull out. And now I've got a table of two columns from the original five with just the org code and the org name. So that'd be quite familiar to people. If you're working from, if you come from an Excel background, you just highlight those um, columns that you want of data and then you sort of copy and paste them somewhere else, either in the same Excel or somewhere else, entirely different. But what we can do in code in R is also select by the position. So just to remind you what the beds data looks like, just writing out the object name and then doing control and enter on that line, you can see we've got date, org code and org name. But instead of writing them out, if you had something and the example would be, say, you get a, a spreadsheet regularly and somebody updates the date in a column. It's always the same column, but they update the date to each month or week that you get that data. So you just want the data and instead of changing your code to reflect the new date, you can just pick it out by its position. So if I take the object and do control shift and M, and if I bring out column three, which is org name to five, org av, so I want these three columns. What I want to do is do select, and then I just write three. If I do three on its own, I just bring out the third column, which is org name. And if I want to do <clears throat> three, four, and five, I do the colon and a five at the end and pre um, do control and enter. And I pick out the three, four, and five. That's really useful for that situation where things change, but the, the position doesn't. But it can be a bit tricky if you're reading through code as well. So you want to know what your data is that you're bringing through. I would, I rarely use that, but I can see a, a really useful situation for it if you're getting returns, for example, from somewhere. Deselecting is really, really useful. So unlike SQL, where you'd have to name every column that you've got, and sometimes tables can be quite long. You can have like 20, 30 columns, and you might just want to drop one or two because they've got information in it, for example, that's based on the SQL database, and it's not really necessary for the data. What we can do in R, which I don't think you can do in SQL, I'd be really pleased to hear that you could do this, is deselect. So a minus in front of org code, instead of having all five columns, now brings it back with the org code removed. I haven't been sharing it, sorry. I've just remembered. So I've copied the code and I will pop it into the chat and deselecting. 
Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Um, just going back to selecting column by position. Yep. When you've got um, select three to five, is that saying selecting row three to five? No, columns. Columns. Select is always about columns. Okay. So All when right. you're selecting rows, that would be um, that's it. yeah. You use you well. You do slice. I think because you're slicing your data. Filters mm -hmm. a bit different. It's a test of a quality that goes behind it. So if you're oh. just saying I want. Uh, I, I don't know how to do it, actually. I've never done that. But selecting a particular row, it's not the top three. You're looking for the third row down. Um, there's probably some code in there that you could do. Okay. I'm, I'm sure it's possible. I've just not done that. But select is all about columns. And to extend on select. I'm sorry. Yep, sorry. Carry on. No, keep, keep going. Just the last one about deselecting. Yep. So you want, is that essentially saying you want everything but something essentially. yes that's right so okay. if you've got a column of 20 columns and that data is useful to you but it's got like row numbers in it which is only useful for sql instead of going listing out the 19 you can just say deselect that row number if you use sql for example you can't do that so that's um when it's useful i think so that you're it's it's less code you're sort of thinking about how do i get my data but doing it in the least amount of typing that's possible. Okay, brilliant, thank you. Yeah, that's cool, great, thanks. Um, so, uh, beds underscore data. Ooh, I did M. I need to do control shift and M for the pipe. And I'm doing select again. If I just take the data set, so we've got date, org code, and org name. Now, if I wanted the org name to be at the front, I want it to be the top. Now, what I tend to do, and I do this so often in my tables and data frames, tables in SQL is I will create the row number at the end of my data. And so it kind of shoves it right over to the right because anything that's new goes to the right. And I really want it at the left side. So I want to reposition it. And there's a couple of ways to do it, but select is a way of picking out your data and putting it in an order that you want. And this is a very simple way of doing um, org name out. I'm putting that first. So I'm listing org name. And instead of listing all the others, because I want everything to be the same, I just want org name and everything else. There's a function called everything. And it comes from dplyr. And it's a, it doesn't require anything in the brackets. It's just a function on its own. And what I've done is plucked out org name, put it at the beginning, and then brought everything back. And it does not get repeated. So it hasn't been repeated and position three as it was before, now position four. Could you use select minus three to five to deselect? I suspect so, let's give it a go. I like that. No, you can't. Now, why not? Um, you might have to do it separately. I've never done it with things like this. Yet, so you'd have to list them out. So you can deselect by position, but it doesn't look like, I'd have to investigate more because it doesn't seem, oh, maybe it's like this actually. Ah, worked it out. So yes is the answer. You can deselect by position, but you have to be specific about your minus. I learned something today, thank you. Give it a go, but um, that, was, that was really nice to do, thanks. So everything. Picked out org name, now goes to the beginning, does not get repeated, and everything else comes afterwards, which is a really nice shortcut in a sense to use. Still with columns, we're doing a lot of work around columns because this is actually quite new to SQL users. When you're working in Excel, you can click and drop and pick out things, but SQL, it's coded. You don't get the same functionality. So I'm just showing it off because I really like this having come from SQL myself. So if I want to select any of these, so it's like a filter that you're used to using or in the where clause where you're searching for something in your data. Now, if I want to search for something in the names of the columns, I can use another function in um, dplyr called starts with. So if I want to pluck out org name and org code because they both start with org, I can use a function that is quite meaningful called starts with. And then in quotations, because it's a string or text, you write org. You can also do ends with, which is really, really useful if you've got some data, say with KPI written in it or um, 
I'm trying to think of KPI is probably one of the best ones. You've got KPI 01, KPI 02, and you want to bring out just the ones with KPI. You can use this string search really for columns, which is not available in my favorite language of SQL. To extend that, this is a terrible example because our, we don't have a big data set and we don't have a lot of information in there. But say if your KPI was built into, it was in the middle of your text string. So it said 01 KPI and then the organizational name, but you just want to bring out anything that's KPI, but it's in the middle. And so it's not at the beginning, it's not at the end, it's in the middle. What we'd kind of expect are these wild cards where you use percentages, but you don't need that with this function because they have just coded it as a word, meaning contains. So that is a function of dplyr. And if I do s underscore a, and I say this is a terrible example because it's part of the word of beds underscore av. It's not really brilliant, but you can use contains. And it will just bring back anything that's got s underscore a. Not a great case example, but you could use it in some other ones. Now, this is an extension of what we've been working with before, because before we corrected the statistical exercise that you went through with the mean and the median and the totals and the percentage totals, the totals and the percentage occupancy, we looked at the data and you got different answers depending on whether you looked at org name or org code. And from that, I discovered, as you do with analysis, that the data is not a one-to-one -one relationship between an org code and an org name. Names have changed over time, there've been mergers, and we didn't realize that when we first did the exercise, or at least I didn't. And it made me um, reflect on what I use in my code a lot, or I certainly did when I was working with patient data, counting your information, and also counting distinct information. So if I just write this out, but explain it as I type, we're using the object again, control shift and M for pipe. I didn't share these ones before actually. Um, I go on to the next line and what I'm gonna do is summarize, but with the number. So I'm just looking for the total count, not summarizing it, not sum, not adding up. I'm just going, how many rows are in here? What's the total um, records, observations, that kind of thing. And if I do a function called n, I get 4,558, which reflects this number up in the object in the Tibble data frame in the top right hand corner. So that gives you just the, dis that gives you, sorry, that's on the wrong line. That should be on the second line. So that gives you the number of uh, rows and records that you've got. But if you wanted a distinct number of records, which is much better in the context, this builds on it, but in the context of say patients, there's a distinct difference as it were between 20 contacts to one patient to 20 contacts to 20 different patients. So I often found my code would be wanting to know the distinct number of say NHS numbers or client IDs as we also refer to them. I wanted to know about people, not referrals. I wanted to know how many people were contributing to referrals and contacts. The function is the same, the context is different. So the name I'm gonna give this summarize is distinct number. And the function is called n underscore distinct. And in there, I'm gonna put org name. And so we've got a distinct number of 255, which that doesn't really mean much at the moment. It's, it's a bit like taking all of your data in Excel and squashing it down just so that you've got your sort of like lookup table as it were of all the organizations. It doesn't mean very much, but if we add in the dot by feature from summarize for org code, we can't see in the top 10 by luck that anything appears other than one. So these are number is just the numbers of uh, rows, observations, data points that we've got to each of the org codes. And the distinct number is how many distinct names are attributed to that code. You can't really see anything in there, but if I do another pipe and filter by my distinct number, which is the information that I created, greater than one. Now we can see that there are more than one names attributed to quite a number. Um, we've got 22 
codes that have more than one name. And I'm always interested to know the highest number. So let's arrange it as we have done by descending distinct number. So I'm exploring my data using code and there are two actually that have three names attached to them. If I give you this code in the chat, what I'm going to do is I can see the details are here actually on the slide, RDE and RTG. Now that doesn't mean anything to me because they're codes that I don't recognize. But if I look at the data that I've opened, if you've got the object in the environment, if you click on beds underscore data, you get view and it opens as its own tab. Mine was already open. I've just opened it again. This view is very handy as well in our studio because you can order and filter things within this view. So you don't necessarily have to code it. We did code it as we've worked along so that you could explore some of the dplyr. But in our studio, we could have just done a click on the beds underscore AV to get the ascending order, which is what we did very early on this morning. And then click it again to get the descending. So you can see Nottinghamshire Healthcare Trust, which is what we did in a second exercise. But if we want to look for these um, names, RDE, we could filter by clicking on the filter button and in org code put RDE and it finds Colchester Hospital, so it's interesting, university. And if you scroll down, here are the other two names that we've got attributed to it. Foundation Trust, so it had a rename, it became a Foundation Trust, then it looks like a merger and became East Suffolk and North Essex. If I look at the other one, just for you know completion's sake, RTG, Derby Hospitals became Derby Teaching Hospitals and then maybe merged and became University Hospitals of Derby and Burton. So we can explore our data in this context, a little bit like Excel, but you can't change your data. There's no way to overwrite your data in this. This is just a viewing facility. If I get rid of the cross, it stops highlighting. I thought it would have stopped highlighting, but there we go. That doesn't change any of the data that we've imported or the object that we were looking at again. Right. Um, we've had a break, actually. So what we're going to do now is look at making an object, because what we've done before is import our data. So it became an object using Redar. But we might wish to keep some of our data that we've created here, some of these more complex bits of code to create new data sets, new data frames. We might wish to use those, so sort of like make them into a temporary table type concept from SQL, make it an object in this environment that then I can reuse elsewhere. How do you name your code chunks? So in Quarto, if you go up to your um, engine, which is the curly brackets with the R, go on to the next line and type hash and then the up and down pipe uh, thing next to the Z key and then label. Um, yes, I will show you the other one. So if I do select function, you can see the name appears in the chunk settings down here. So I've now called that select function. I'm going to control an S to save that because it hasn't saved for a while. How did you show the previous table? Uh, this one? Is this what you mean? Sorry, the previous table. Oh, the previous table, this um, tab. When you've imported your data, I've got beds underscore data in my environment. You might also have capacity underscore AE from yesterday. If you click on the word beds underscore data, it runs the code which you may be familiar with, which you could also use code, but it's easier to press, even for somebody like me who's not that great with their mouse, and it opens it up as its own tab. Is that what you were missing? Correct. You can filter. You can order, but there's also a button here I forgot to show you. So it's great that you brought me back to it. Show in new window. So it's a, it's like a window, but with an arrow pointing up. If you press that, you're on a browser for a lot of people. So you might have pop-ups that are not allowed, but it should pop it out as a new window, which is really good on your own computer because then you can have your data right next to your code. So it doesn't change it, I don't think, unless you rerun it. You'd have to change your object, and I think it, it's, so it's not dynamic because what we're doing here is completely distinct to what we're seeing on the left. But it does mean that you've got that capacity to have it open next to your coding, which is useful, and a bit more data than just the top ten. Oh, one thing I forgot to do: 
you pop it out, you can also pop it back in. I've just popped out my entire quarto. So if I want my entire quarto report to go back in, it's the same button, but the arrow pointing down between the save and the arrows. And I do want that back in there. So I always forget that you can do that. So some of our code we may wish to use again, and we may want to do some statistics on it, and we then may want to visualize it. And we don't want to repeat the same code. So if we were using this data set down here, for example, we wouldn't want to have that several lines of code from this line, this chunk in each of the sections that we're using. We want to make this to be available in the environment like we have the original data imported. And kind of explaining, and I've sort of done this already, which is this temporary status. This is code that just exists as you run it. So everything that we've run so far just exists for the moment that you run it. It's not available anywhere else in your R Studio. It doesn't change anything and it's not available to be used in anything else, any other analysis. And if you do make it into the environment, it's temporary still. It doesn't change the original data. And it's closer to a temporary table type concept, as in SQL. I'll put this code into the chat. It's the things that we've been working on already. Uh, in fact, that one's correct because it says org name there. So that's interesting. So I corrected it on this sheet, but not the other one. Maybe that's why I missed it on the answer sheet. Um, and what we're going to do is put it in there. And if you run that code now, as it is, you'll get two objects now, well, more than one, starting with beds. We've got beds underscore occupancy and beds underscore data, which is the original code, the original data, sorry, that we imported. We've named it bed occupancy, which is this name here, and then use this strange symbol which is an arrow to the left and a hyphen or um, a minus sign. Okay, do you want to show me your code on which bit? So you, sorry, are you you getting an error on the code that I've just shared? Uh, sorry, it's the the previous one, not this one. Um... Do you, want to just put, do you want to just put it in the chat, the one that you're trying to run and getting an error? And maybe I could work out what we're doing from that. Um, it's seeing the filter, error in the filter. Right. What would the issue was? Ah, oh, cold. distinct number. That's very strange. So what I'm just going to do is run the first few lines of code. Okay. And that runs. And I run the filter. And that doesn't run. So this distinct number. Oh, there we go. It's missing a U in uh, the first one. <laughs> I knew it was going to be something like spot the difference. Uh, and I couldn't that see that at first. Uh, Tell uh, you one of the things that catches me out all the time are these brackets, which is uh, one thing. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, names. Brilliant. Thank you for that. That kept me on my toes. Um, right. So this strange symbol, which is called the assign operator, which is very much like an equals, as in an alias, and in fact does the same thing. So equals will create the same object. And there's no problem with it, but it's kind of convention within our programming to use this key, which is shortcut is an alt and the minus key together. And it puts in those spaces around your code. The reason why I think it's used is because when R, maybe its predecessor S, which was the proprietary software was created, it used to be a key on people's keyboards. So it used to be there. And it's just one of those things that if people use an equal sign, then I'm like, mm, they don't come from R. That's the only thing. Um, so it's kind of convention, but it works. You don't have to use it, but it's just, yeah, I don't know. Pe people just like it a lot in R. And when I, I'm not sure if I'll have a chance to show you, but the style guides that come from Tidyverse, you can use equals and then apply some package code on it to make all your code 
fit the conventions so that you can type what you like and then tidy it up afterwards just by running some code, which is nice. So we've now saved it as an object, which means that if I write beds underscore, what did I call it? Occupancy. I'm doing it into the console so I don't keep that. Well, oh, actually, I might, I'll change it. I'll put it in here. Oh, did I not run it? Oh, it's because I ran some other code. I called it beds. There, have, there was an S in there in beds occupancy. So I run my code to create an object. And now I can use that and refer to it as if it's an object, a data frame like I've imported the data because I've created it. That means if there's any changes, I can just change it in one place rather than change it in multiple places across my code. Just a quick thing on naming style. I didn't realize these kind of naming conventions have names themselves. So camel case is used quite a lot in R where the first word is all lowercase and then subsequent words have capitals after them. Pascal case is where each one has a capital at the beginning. Uh, what I will say about this is we discussed this in my team a previous team that I worked in and some members did not get camel case. They just didn't like it. It just didn't seem to make sense because why is all one lowercase? So we agreed never to use it. We have to use it for packages because that's convention in the packaging systems that we use with R. But often we, I don't really use Pascal case either, but I tend to use snake case as you can see in some of my data sets and also this thing called kebab case where it's a minus or a, a a hyphen. In your R code, an underscore is preferable to a space, but a minus is sort of seen. You can just see it's slightly blue. It won't, well not, of course, it won't work because that's not even a thing. But if I put it in here, sorry, um, it's seeing it as bed minus occupancy. So I can't use that in a naming convention. But you can do that in your labels. So you might see this in labels. So it will be fine. It will just show like that and it won't break anything. So I have seen kebab case used a lot in our markdown. I might see it a bit more in quarto as examples come out, but the most well used in R is snake case. But I did see something about accessibility and how this is quite difficult when you use a screen reader because it says underscore and that can be quite tedious. So it might be that R eventually moves to say something like Pascal case to help screen readers. I don't know. But they've all got names, so the best idea is to be consistent um, and also to share and agree that with your team colleagues. So if they prefer one way and you all agree to use that, then stick to that. I'm not going to introduce vectors. I'm going to launch straight into joins. We used to have to call or, or refer to vectors uh, because the joins used to rely upon a particular thing in vectors. I would say it's really useful to go through that um, because vectors are really important to R. It's used a lot in R, but I'm going to show joins for today to because I'm just quite conscious of the time. There will be recordings of me talking about vectors and those sections in other courses, I'm sure. But just to introduce relational data, because it's really important for what we do, um, whether you're using SQL or some other things, Excel, you have that possibility of doing HLOOKUPs, VLOOKUPs, uh, VLOOKUPs is the most common, and there's a new one with XLOOKUP, where we join data together that's sort of like flat data, as they call it. So we've just been working on one data set. You get more information when you join it to another data set with um, just thinking with data that matches to it so we can add more information to it. We might have a patient data set and we add it to their addresses and now we can find out more information about them as a patient and their address by joining, for example. You will have used joins a lot in SQL, I think, if you have uh, coded in SQL. And all of the joins, I think now I can say, because there's been some changes that exist in SQL and now in dplyr. There are a couple of joins that uh, are they exist in R, but the concept is different in SQL. So it's the concept is in the joins. They're called filtering joins. But in SQL, it's if you've ever used exists, and that goes in the where clause. So that's in the filtering side rather than the joins. But that's what they're doing. They're, they're doing the same thing. I have to say, I didn't understand exists in SQL very well. 
but as a join, it makes a lot of sense. So I actually had more understanding of a language that I'd come from by learning a new approach and a new way of doing things. So I liked working between the two. Aside from the inner join that people will be familiar with, a left join is one of the most common, I think, in all the joins that we do, where we take a table on the left and a table on the right, and we join them together by matching data, uh, so matching IDs, and then we drop everything on the right that doesn't match. So three doesn't match to the right, and it doesn't have anything added where the other two do. So there is nothing in this cell. And three, a uh, four, sorry, gets dropped. I'm going to give you five minutes to import some data. And I want you to import data to work with these joins called TB. They all begin with TB underscore cases, new table, and pop. Just to give you a bit of quiet from me, um, now you can either write the code, which um, I'll find the code as I go along. You can either go and do the import from readr dot 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 and then locate the data, or as I'm going to do, which is just import them. They don't need tidying, they're all set. So you just click on them and import and then import again. And I'll give you five minutes just to have a go and update those and I'll be doing it as well, bringing them into your system. Okay, what we're just doing um, is importing three data sets that are in your data tb underscore cases. You don't need to do any changes with them. You can just click on them and then select import data set. Uh, object creation. Let me just see. No, just introducing joins. I'm not sure how. And I'll, I'll give you the code to get the data in. And we haven't done any code yet for joins. So I'm just doing this. to bring them in. Okay, so this is the code. If anybody wants to just pop that in to get those data sets, that's the other way of doing it, get code. OK, I've given five minutes, but I just want to see, has everybody got the three data sets imported, either using the code or practicing some of the imports? We've got thumbs up, two people. Three. I don't want to race ahead if people are still working away on these things. It may be that people have stepped. It's very difficult because somebody might have stepped away from the computer, might be doing something else. OK, I think what I'll do is move on um, and hopefully people can catch up if they are missing that bit. So the, the code is in the chat as well. So when we join two tables together, we um, are going to have a look at joining. Oh, one of these is not open. TB pop. So I've got my three open because I just, oh, what have I done here? Oh, it's frozen. Sorry, I'm uh, losing control of my browser here. What's going on here? Oh, right, I'm just going to have to do F5. It's gone all very strange on me just to refresh the cloud. 
what I was trying to show you is that I'd opened up the three TB tables and you can just click on them and then they do the view but I also did that from the wizard. So that's why they're open. You can move them as well. So you can move them. We're going to use TB pop. So I'm going to put that first. No, we're not, we're doing cases and then pop so that they're next to each other just makes it easier to view. Go down to the bottom and try and do that R again to get a new um, chunk. So if I do TB underscore T, I'm not doing very well here at all. TB underscore cases, control and enter shows you the data that we get. That's the data set, it's all 16 lines, you get all of them shown, or you can look at the data here. We've got country, year, and cases. If I want to join, Control Shift and M for a pipe does the next lead to the function, which is called left join from dplyr, and it's got the same name as a join in SQL, which is nice. So if I put tb underscore pop, and if I want to join to tb pop, we've got country, year, and pop. So I'm going to join in the first instance by equals country. So country has to be in quotation marks because it's a string and it's a big giveaway. It's like a, a big reveal. There are duplications in this because I actually have two columns that match in name. So I have country in both of them and I have year in both. But looking at the data, this way, there's lots of indicators now as to why or how this is occurring. You don't get the same name in R when you do a join. It doesn't get repeated. So it doesn't say year and year. So it says year.x and year.y. That occurs automatically. So because they have two columns of the same name, they add in a little bit or the, the program package adds in a little bit to change the name to define it. So it means that Afghanistan is repeated four times in 1999 matching this population in these four years from 1999 to 2002. The other information though that is really useful and I, I kind of kick myself that I hadn't really thought about this and I coded for such a long time doing joins that we have 16 observations in each of these um, data sets and we'd expect a left join to return 16 from the original data set but what we're getting returned is 64, hence the duplications. You now get a warning message from, um, or maybe you've always had it, I just didn't notice it before, but it says detected an unexpected many-to-many -many relationship. You can keep this if this is something that you wanted to, um, that you want those duplications to appear, that's fine. And you can suppress the message and it gives you this code to put that into to suppress it, but we don't. We want country and year to be joined to each other. Um, so that we can remove these duplications, duplicates, and so we can see all, all of our data. I have to get my, oh, I want this to show two things. It wasn't really showing my two windows. So to do this, we need to tell it two columns to join onto. So in SQL, you would be very um, specific and say country, country, year, year, that kind of thing. And that's what we're following. This is the old way of doing it using a vector. And I'm not going to cover that today necessarily, but that's what it looks like. You'll see that in other people's code. The vector is often denoted by this C, meaning combine or concatenate, not concatenate in an Excel way. Does the need to be dot by, not just by? So this is a different by. They're very well spotted. This is interesting that they haven't done that. Um, this is old now. So maybe that was something that they were thinking about doing. Maybe that's what introduced the issue to the previous one. So over time, maybe this became an issue. Um, it could, yep, I don't know why it doesn't have by, I was thinking that maybe there'd be an answer, but no, maybe it was missed. So the, but the dot is just to differentiate it from columns. So it might've been missed on that previous occasion. It's been replaced now by its own function. My highlighting is a bit bold. And what I will do is if I write, TB cases, control shift and M for the pipe, left join TB underscore pop and join by gets a prompt for the function in dplyr. So if you were to select that, it's all right. You can now write country and year. I'm putting them on two lines just so that you can see them clearly. They don't have to be in quotation marks and a closing bracket, which I was missing, which is what that cross was reminding me about. And now 
I get 16 rows returned with no warning about there being duplications or more being returned than you'd expect. So the function, the new function is quite good because it does mean that you don't need to list it out with the joins, you know, with the quotations, you don't have to do that. If you did, it still works. It's really good. It's very clever, but it's just an added couple of characters. So it's a bit more typing to do. And the reason why I really like joins in R is because you can be really lazy. So if you know that you've got the same column names, you've got NHS number to NHS number, for example, in this case, we do know, or you just wanted to check to see if they would match together with no input from you at all. You can just write TB cases, which is a left table, join to TB pop, and it does it for you. So I'll just share that code in the chat. And it's good to be explicit, but what this is nice for is that it gives you the code. And in fact, it does the by equals as well still. And I'd forgotten about that. So you can add that into your code and that will work. So it tells you what it's joined on. So you can be really lazy, take two tables, join them together, see what matches, and then be explicit about what you want it to match on if you didn't want it to match on all of them. Sorry, could you just go over that again? So are you saying in this case, where you do the left join and don't specify what column you want both data sets to be joined by, R would work out which one has the most matches, join it and then tell you what variable it joined it on. Yes, that's it, perfectly. I would say dplyr is the only thing that is the specific thing to do that join. It's not R necessarily, it's dplyr has used R to say, these have the same name. And when I say the same name, it has to be exactly the same. So the same case is really important. We'll see in the next example where they don't match necessarily correctly because they're well, actually different words. But if I had country with a capital C and country with a little c, it would not see the match. We would see it because we can read it's the same word, but it's it very pedantic around case. But you've summed it up perfectly. Sometimes we have to join by different names. Um, I do need to change this slightly to emphasize that thing about case statement. But if we were to take TB cases and joined it to TB underscore new underscore table, which is a contrived table, all it has is the first letter of the country, which I've renamed to place in it. If I just did that join left join to TB underscore new, there are no common details in there. There's just nothing for it to join on. You have to be explicit in it. So the old way was using this C, but I'm gonna share with you the new way, which is a little bit easier, I think. Oh, it would help if oh, I've made it bold. I don't know why I made it bold. Let's get rid of bold, it's a bit shouty, maybe not. Okay, I don't know why I made it bold. I don't know how I did that in Zoom, but I'm working off this code at the bottom here. So where I've got TB underscore new table, if I, I'm not going to use the by equals actually, because I'm going to be a bit lazier and just use the function join by country equals equals place. So it's a test of equality. That's very key to this. I'm going to give it a bit more space so that it's ordered a little bit on my screen. And then year equals equals year. And now I can see the join with these letters onto it. Now, you can do them in quotations, I think. It's pretty relaxed about whether you do them as quotations. It's just extra keys, so that's okay. But the thing that is really key to this is the order, so the position. So if we can look at the country and the year, they come from the table on the left, the first one mentioned, and the data retains those names in it. If I started with it the other way around, it would retain the TB underscore new tables column headers. And the other point to bear in mind with this is if you get your left and your right columns the wrong way around, so place comes from the right, country comes from the left, it breaks because it needs to be exact in its position. 
oh, it would help if I said equals equals as well as that too. So two reasons why I broke it. One of them is I only used a single equals. When I corrected that, I still got an error because place doesn't exist in the left side. It exists on the right. So the position is very, very important when you're doing your joins. Put that equals in again. And then we get our data working, which is the code that I shared in the chat. So those are the principles that work in the other joins. Inner join, left join, no, I did left join, right join, those ones. And a couple of them that I'll talk through, which are really useful. So I'm just going to highlight them to you. I'm not going to go through the examples because I want to go through some of the um, explore, exploratory help functions that we've got or help ways, ways of getting help or get the words out eventually. Is if you ever use SQL, this is exists in the where clause. I don't know if this exists at all in Excel. I don't think this necessarily appears in XLOOKUP because XLOOKUP is based on SQL, I think. And this isn't a join in SQL. But a semi-join will take your data off the left. And this GIF kind of shows it if, if you follow it. It looks like an inner join in that it drops those that don't match on the left and the right. But what is key to this is it's also dropping the Y information to it. So it's just saying, does it exist? That's where that exists comes in, on the right. If it does, I'm just going to keep what's on my left. That's it. An example that was given quite early on, because I think this might have been in 2020 when I did these courses, hospital test cases were really important. And people came up with this situation where they'd have a list of patients and you wanted to see if they'd had a test. And you only wanted to know that they'd had a test, no information from it at all. So they take their list, match it to a different one and say, yep, they're on the list, keep that information. And there's probably some other situations as well that you do that. So I've got some contrived examples, but I'll just keep moving on. The anti-join is the opposite of that. So you could do that in a sense with the COVID test. I want to test who hasn't had, who doesn't appear on the second list with um, a test for COVID, and I only want to keep them. So this is what's happening with the anti-join in this GIF. We've got one and two, they match on the right. So we drop them, we drop the four because that doesn't match. And we keep three because it doesn't exist on the right. That would be not exists in SQL. The example that was also given in a training course, there were some great examples, is in text mining. So when we use text mining in healthcare, we're not looking for linguistic words quite often. We're not linguists. So we want to remove a lot of the language that is repetitive, that is called stop words, like but, and, and or. They're not necessary for the analysis that we do. We tend to want to look for things like medicine, nurse, environment, referral, those kind of words. So we take some text, match it against our list of stop words, and if it's there, we drop it. And we keep all those other words for text mining. I've whizzed through those. So I would suggest going back to those sessions or there's also some YouTube videos on it as well to go into more detail and get in touch as well through the NHSR Slack group if you wanted to use any joins and wanted to understand them a bit more. I think what's really important is finding some help though because there's various levels of finding help. Well, but before I do that, I'll just check that that's okay with the joins. You've been asking questions throughout, but just to just to double check, everything seems okay. Okay. There's a lot of information that we've got around our packages, but it's, um, for example, we've used some functions um, and those functions have changed over time and they do other things. Uh, so it's just trying to find out, I've got this function, I want to know what it does. How do I find out some more about it? And one of the functions that's on this sheet is one that we haven't used, which is ggsave. So I think that one comes from the ggplot. So you build your plot and then you save that. And you can use this function to save it to your system. But the ones that we've used, for example, I'm going to look at summarize. So we've got this dot by in here, but what else does it do? How can we use it? or mutate even. Actually, maybe if I look at mutate, that's kind of a clear one. If you put your cursor anywhere in your code script, or even if you, um, yeah, I'll just put it on the code script is probably the best way. 
and press F1 on your keyboard, it opens up the help file pane within our studio in the bottom right, and it takes you directly to the function that you've, you're wanting to look at. This has got the mutate information. And I have to say, there's a lot of information in here that's taken me a number of years to understand what it does. And it's not always that clear, I think, as you first start. So there's a few other things that can go into it, dot by, dot keep, dot before, and dot after. So they seem to have put a lot more dots into mutate than they have in the other functions. This has a bit of information about each of the things. Again, I'd probably still struggle. It's a level of knowledge that I've built up over time with R. But this can be useful where it tells you the badge. So this part of dot by is actually in the experimental phase. As it's used a lot, people feed back at issues and errors and they get debugged. It may become stable. I think they've got different badges and, and including one that's de deprecated where they've they keep it but they don't maintain it anymore. So it gives you that warning. The really, really useful part of these help files though is if you go all the way to the bottom where you get examples of your code. Now the tidyverse is really exemplary in what it does with its examples. It gives you code that you can run directly in your console. So this is Star Wars showing you mutate and you can run that code and it just runs and it's fine to see. So that's really the helpful thing I've always found to look at the examples. But if you want to find out what's possible within a function, what it does, find other functions, F1 will take you to that and you can search for them as well. So this magnifying glass in the panel bit, the pane, looks at all the packages. And then there's another search function within that particular help file that you're working with. I looked at a help file earlier when I was doing that um, thing through the break and so you can move between your previous views of things so I looked at NA in base and looks like I looked at something else as well didn't I not available that's the last one so you can flip between them so you don't have to keep opening them each time you can use that back and front back and forth I should say not back and front but you can also select from the console a function now there are different you have to be careful of the different ways that you look for things if you've got your package already loaded, which we have done with Tidyverse, if you do a question mark, and although we haven't done ggplot2, we've loaded it, if we wrote ggsave, either here in the editor or down in the console, it opens up the particular help file relating to ggsave. But if we were to do that for something called beep, which is a function from the package beepr, it wouldn't find it because we haven't loaded it. It is available. So if I go to packages, uh, I think you might have done this actually when I first, because we had a few problems, didn't we? Oh, no, it isn't. It's not in this one. Sorry. Let's try again. I thought I'd installed it in this workspace. It's a very small package. Beep R's there. And then go back and do beep. It still doesn't find it. So the function if you don't have, not the function, if you don't have the package, I used install as the wizard and typed bpar quickly because it found, found it in Crown and it's a really small package. It's not loaded though, and it won't work on the cloud because it doesn't have access to your sound card, but um, it doesn't find it because it needs to be lo loaded. But if you still wanted to find out what it was without loading it, you can write bpar, which is like the pathway colon colon so this package colon colon and then the function if i do control and enter now it finds the exact help file in the bottom right interestingly also if you do as it said in this error this sort of message here it wasn't really an error it's just a message if you do question mark question mark it takes your search from local to global and if you look for beep you get various options control and enter when I'm in the editor because it matches on a few of the functions and it doesn't know necessarily which one you want so you can select it that way. Any duplication of something like a question mark or if you're on SQL and it's a hash and you're doing temporary tables that makes it global if you do two hashes and if you do a single hash or a single question mark it's only looking at what you've loaded locally. These are all available when you're not online so if you were say working away on a train with no Wi-Fi, you can find out help files as you're working along through your computer. But a lot of these 
are also repeated on the internet. General help when you're stuck on a particular problem can be um, quite helpful to go to a couple of groups that we've got. So there's our studio, I need to change these, these are old slides, but our studio community, which is now POSIT community, is a very friendly space. Lots of questions are asked uh, about often POSIT products or interactions with POSIT products. So there's all sorts of questions in here. The only problem I found with it um, is that the topic closes 21 days after it's been finished and replied to, I should say, not finished. And things don't get finished is the thing. So a different answer could be added to it years later, but this doesn't give that facility anymore. So it's it's not always that great for older reference stuff, which is a bit of a shame, but it is a very friendly area. We've also got our Slack group, which I shared with you, which is because it's a conversation area and because we don't have a paid account, technical questions get lost over time and technical answers do. So it's a really friendly place to meet people who will understand the context, let's say. So if you say, I've got this problem with RTT data or KHO3 or some other word, IMD maybe, um, people will kind of know what those acronyms are as well as the technical question you're talking about. So if you said, I'm just looking for IMD data from 2015, not 2019, people will know what it is that you're talking about, for example. And Stack Overflow is one of the best places of getting information, but there is a bit of a technique to sort of navigate through it, particularly for R. Unlike Slack, uh, SQL, and I would say to some extent Excel, there's always like a really good answer to questions, but there's so many different approaches in R. Stack Overflow just needs a bit of navigating to locate the thing that ma makes sense to you. Cheat sheets are a really great way to find out more information about what a package does, not just the functions, but like in Deeply, I've said it's a big package, what's actually in it. And there are cheat sheets throughout the web here. So if I go to, I've got to find it now, all cats, Deeply, Reader, there, Deeply. View the cheat sheet. Ooh, we get information here. I was looking at, I've never seen it in that context. That's nice. The PDF is a quite a big document. And I think what people like to do is print it out or it gives you the idea of what you don't know, I suppose. It's like, you know about grouped cases, but this is also giving you a bit more information about grouping them by row rather than by column. So it's a nice way of sort of highlighting new things to you as you're working. And in, oh, that's the wrong button. I was just clicked on R Studio, which is my own. I didn't mean to do that. In R Studio, in the help menu, there is cheat sheets. So you can find some of the, as I was scrolling through and trying to find them, you can find them more directly through those cheat sheets and some links and they take you to the internet, which is quite useful. And Saving your script, this, these are old slides which relate to the way, the format of the previous courses, which we did before. What you'll find actually in our studio, which I've only just noticed, is if you haven't saved for a while, it, the title goes a bit, uh, a different color. Blue in my context with a star next to it. Now, if I press control and S to save it, it then goes white, meaning it's been saved. So if I make any changes, like I put in a return key, it changes color. So that's a nice indicator, as well as the fact that you can save this as you would do in any other program like Microsoft, for example. Save all, save and other things. These two document, these two books, I don't think are free online anymore. And this is an old book for R for Data Science because these slides need to be updated. But I will share with you the new edition of Hadley Wickham's and the various pe other people actually who do this. Um, Let's make it bigger. So the books that Hadley Wickham has written, and that includes things for Shiny, Advanced R, and R for Data Science, which is his most popular, I think, I would hasten to say, um, they're all available free online, which is quite good so that they get updated, but it also means that you have access to it without having to necessarily buy it. It is available in paper. Uh, it's a big book, and some people have bought them and 
use them that way, that's fine. It has the new things that have come in recently, like Quarto, and also some information about which I'm not going to cover, I don't think, because I don't have time, but code styles and how to use the package that Posit have created to set styles. And it's really clear and concise. It's very nice. There are exercises in the book as well. And I just discovered that the answers are available by one of the authors is writing them after data science. Oh, is it this one? Solutions. Nope, it's not that one. I can't. Ah, it's not showing it now. But um, there will be solutions that are written by the authors for the book, which is quite good, because at the moment, the, the first edition didn't have the answers and there was an unofficial guide. But there is some detail on our um, GitHub page is what I was trying to say. So a couple of other ongoing resources, particularly Stack Overflow, it's in a different slide deck. Just to reinforce that learning R is not going to just occur in these two mornings. It's like a spoken language. It's used over time. Try and use it as much as you can. It can be really difficult, though, when you're already working in a language with a program that you need to get some work done quickly. What I would say is, although it says regular total immersion, is it is the best way. It can be hard to do. What is a nice way of making it so it's easier is that you replicate what you've already done. So you kind of know what the response or the, the result would be from whatever it is that you use. So if you already create charts in Excel, creating a chart in R is helpful. If you do statistics, somebody uses Stata, try the statistics in R, and then you know that you've got the right result when you can compare the two because you trust what you've done in Stata or SAS or SPSS is another common one and then trying to see if you can replicate that in R. That can be really useful. My area was always about data manipulation. So tidying data, and then I try and compare the, t the data tidying and the numbers and things like this between the data sets, whether I've used SQL or whether I used R. It takes time. This says quick fix. I'm not so sure it's a quick fix, but this is kind of like the normal fix is Stack Overflow. There is a vocabulary that's required for it because um, what I would always say is if you're looking for dplyr questions, write dplyr in your search because it takes you to those particular areas. Because if you say, I want to group by multiple columns, which is one of the examples we'll look at, it will give you various options which relate to that, which may be in languages that you don't necessarily even recognize. And R is really difficult to search for because it's just a letter. But after a time of searching, Google picks up your preferences, I'm sure, because I get a lot of R things now. So if we look at this particular one, group by multiple columns, if you're not familiar with Stack Overflow, it's used by for lots of uh, technical problems or question technical programs and programming languages. And what's nice about it is that you get the history. This has been going for 11 years. It's been viewed 95,000 times. It's I wonder if it's been used as an example in other training sessions, because I don't think we've done it necessarily. But um, you can uptick the questions and you can down tick them or you can uptick the answers as well. But if a question has been around for a long time, particularly in R, we'll get questions that start off quite low down, but are really useful. And this was one of them, actually, the dplyr. That never used to be one of the first answers. That used to be a lot lower because if you look at the question actually it's a data table and ply r as we look down some of the oh, we'll get to ply r which is the precursor to d ply r so the question was written around the time of the package which is now no longer used it's kind of deprecated entirely so d ply is one of the more highly rated questions it's been edited i think for this way where it says a modern answer using dplyr across, which is a, quite a recent function. And that's familiar to you using the pipes and using group by and summarize, but using a particular function called summarize each. So that's pretty good. And it's been up voted in a sense over time. But the DT one here, data table, is also well voted because they're two different, they're, they're both really good answers, but they're different uh, packages. So there's nothing wrong with either of them. And the actual, the third, favorite here where there's only a, a point between them is for base r so people who code in base r this is a great question and data table which is 
you can see the tech, the syntax is slightly different, but it's very powerful. It's very, very fast. And in fact, tidyverse people, I'd say posit generally, have a package that there are two packages that are really useful where they have a deep layer way of coding, but then can code in SQL using DB table. And then DT table is that you can get the power of data table, but using it through um, like a translator service really to deep layer. This is the Ply R package, so it's still upvoted quite high. It's not a bad answer, it's just it's related to a package which is deprecated. So there isn't anything in there to notify you of that deprecation. And also DD Ply. So I have done this when I first started coding. I mixed them to get together by accident. I mixed a bit of Ply R and a bit of D Ply R, not realizing that they were distinctly different and could clash because they use different they use similar, there's a bit of a crossover, but dplyr was the more modern version in a sense. And even as we go down, these are still really good answers, although they're not highly rated. So this one tells you specifically about dplyr from the version, which is a new version, because it hasn't, it's only got a couple of versions releases using summarize and across with the verb everything. So that's actually really good using the by function too in summarize. That's really recent but not upvoted. And I would actually look at those ones towards the bottom as well as the top. So you have to skim all of them and check the date too. So that was 2020, so it's pretty recent. So Stack Overflow can be quite tricky. You have to read it all. If I ever see anything with dplyr, not dplyr, sorry, the other one, square brackets, which you get in base R and data table, I tend to ignore it. I just sort of skim over it because I don't always want to mix the two together. There's been occasions when I've used data table because it's fast, but because I didn't understand how it all fit together, I could have a knock on effect with my other code. Um, I, I feel like I must learn data table to be able to use it. But there are people in the Slack channel who use data table in preference to dplyr. And that's fine and they'll be happy to help, I'm sure. So it's longer term fixes. I think kind of these are all a bit of a mixture, but if you wanted to read the book, the new one, the, I think ggplot2 may have been on a new release as well. So they've both been updated. Plot book Hadley. Second edition. I'm not sure if that one's a new edition now. Maybe not. Nope. I think it's still the, the original. Oh, nope. There we go. ggplot2. So They've all been updated, it seems. So that's ggplot2, and I'll give you Hadley Wickham's R for Data Science as well. They're really good books. Oh, and this has got several authors, by the way. I shouldn't forget all the other authors. Garrett Grolmond and mine, I think it's mine. She is fabulous, uh, but I'm not entirely sure how to say her full name. But she is amazing at data science. Big Book of R is project from somebody who came to talk at NHSR community a few years ago at the conference. He started off by trying to collect all the links that are possible within R. And as you can see, as I scroll down, I'm not going to focus in on anything. There are hundreds by topics and by domain knowledge. NHSR features in it for our book club, but we probably need to change it. You can contribute to what information you have here. Some of these Thinking about it, because our links are probably out of date now, or we need to add stuff. But for example, there's a lot of shiny information in there. There's a huge, a heap of information and he updates it regularly. He's got the, a huge system to get this done. When it says big book, it's enormous. So that would be useful to, to look through. And I think most of the resources are free. There are also blogs that come through. So this is kind of sort of finding out things that you didn't know that you needed to know. That's a good way of finding them out. There's a couple that come out regularly, our weekly and our bloggers. And the NHSR community blog is something that you're invited to contribute to if you wanted to. And I've done a few things. I've been trying to keep up more regularly, but it's quite difficult to blog um, when you're doing all the other things and building books, which is what I've done. But the blog can be submitted to, I'll go to the actual blogs, whether you write in um, R or just submit a Word document, for example. So a lot of the blogs I've been doing have been for AFA. So I've been sharing information and updates about NHSR with AFA. So it appears in their newsletter. That's the Association for Professional Healthcare Analysts. And then 
posting it on our own website as well. And people are very welcome to join in. I think this one's by Sammy about the data science assembly. So that was one of the latest ones that came out. And I won't go into those ones. I will say that's the end of the finding help. Those slides need a bit of updating because a lot has changed recently. The slides I've been working from are on the GitHub. There are some other slides here that need a few bits of work I, I do a need, uh, including the ggplot2, as I mentioned yesterday. But there's a couple more about data manipulation because there's so much that can be done with data. So strings, for example, looking for parts of your strings, all of your string, that kind of thing. There's a lot of work that you can do there. So those slides, no, I'm afraid you can't do any ggplot coding today because it's only two mornings. The NHSR community volunteered normal course, I think people do cover it, um, but the slides are available to work through from the original slides, actually, if you wanted to go through that. I particularly like to concentrate on data manipulation before the plots, but the course is also based on, for ggplot2, basic, for particularly on Hadley Wickham's book too, or Hadley Wickham, Garrett and Mines book on data visualization so that you can see your data early on. But a lot of people already see a lot of their data regularly because we're data analysts and data scientists or people who work with data. So cleaning the data is one of our key features of our work. So I don't cover that. I'm not going to cover that today because I didn't book in for three mornings. It's been a bit busy for the rest of the NHSR community conference. And NHS PyCom too, because we have Python talks and workshops. I'm sure you've already seen a lot of our a lot of our events, so please do sign up to them um, if there's opportunity. So we've got talks coming up that are online, in person, and it'll also be streamed virtually. Talks in Birmingham on the 17th and 18th of October, and other workshops that I hope also will go onto YouTube for catch up if you don't if you're not available on those days. I will wrap this up for the recording.